Special Operations, Covert Ops, Espionage, The Team House, with your hosts, Jack Murphy and David Park. Hello, everyone. Welcome to episode 215 of The Team House. I'm Jack Murphy here with David Park. Returning for his fourth appearance, I believe, on The Team House is Andrew Milburn. Tonight, he wants to announce the formation of the Beethoven Group in Taiwan, right? (laughs) This was not rehearsed, was it? (laughs) All right, Jack, you got me on that one. Dee's going to be CFO. But the problem is, now that's gathered wings already. There you go. Go on. Yeah, let's let's get into the questions pretty quick. Yeah. Dave will be S3 and I'll be handing out basketballs in the gym. I'm nowhere near Taiwan. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so um, this is your fourth time on. Uh, we love having you in and, and just hanging. And uh, It took us 40 minutes to figure out it's the fourth time on. So without D, I don't think we ever would have. No, we had to go back and count. Well, D went back and count. <coughs> because... Because as as the New York Times and many other have uh, so uh, generously pointed out, this is a show where we drink hard liquor in our living room setting. <laughs> um, I'm glad they appreciate the living room setting because we did a great quite a job bit of work that went into that, yeah. you know, make a homey sort of atmosphere. What they don't know is you guys actually do live here. It's not a pretense. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So it's we actually will be on yeah, the floor. Yeah. yeah. This is the living so, room. The uh yeah, the crash pad it's is a visible there. sign of there being no safety net in the welfare state. There there you go. There you go. Um so a lot's happened since the last time we saw you. Where do we begin? Well, I mean a I lot think, happened right after I, so, we saw you. So as we strategized before this which we never do i think probably best i think probably the best approach because you guys ask excellent questions and you don't your audience doesn't want to listen to me rabbit on forever i mean jack you have a substack account now please subscribe to jack's substack account with 3500 subscribers and you're an investigative the journalist. high side it's out there if you guys yeah. want to find it investigative and and dave of course it needs uh needs i mean a lot of times dave was the only one left answering relevant <laughs> pertinent understandable questions look i just handle my booze better than well, you well long beyond when i was able to answer <laughs> anyway my point is yeah you this, that, that's too wide that's too wide an aperture what has happened since we last met and it's only been four months but yeah all kinds of things have happened but yeah. you're an international man of mystery so shit happens fast uh, i'm trying to de I not demystify myself. I'm yeah. actually trying to to sink into the shadows yeah. again a little bit. Yeah. How's that going um, on the podcast? Uh I'm not I'm not doing podcasts anymore. So the irregular warfare podcast, um, which I actually really enjoy doing. Um no no, I wasn't fired. Was, I went to Ukraine. Um but the interesting thing about that, I know this is probably <laughs> This is not something that's happened in the last four or five months, but on the topic of podcasts, irregular warfare podcast, which I don't know if you listen or not, is doing very well, much better after I left it. Um, I really enjoyed doing it. Uh, it got me out of my comfort zone. But the downside was editing and putting it all yeah, together. Yeah. yeah. That's why we uh, we took the lazy angle and we don't edit. Because, I mean, we have people out there like Max Blumenthal to do our editing for us. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Oh, my God. Okay. <laughs> all right. So, let's so get we, into Okay, it. sure. All right. Yeah, yeah. Let's kick it off. Um, so no, this is not really a mea culpa, uh, but yes, for those of you, I, I'm looking at this whiteboard that says road to hundred K subscribers. Yeah, so, yeah. I'm supposed to so tease are, out the people to a like, whole, share and subscribe to the there's channel. There's a whole yeah. audience out there who does not know who Max Blumenthal is and all the, Our, and they're better for uh, it. Our and audience they, doesn't give a shit. Yeah. Uh, so uh, let me just explain very quickly. Um, as, 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 and all you have to do is read the New York Times article, all right, uh, Jeffrey Gettleman, who, who's a Pulitzer White Prize winner, um, I thought was very sympathetic towards me. And the way that article was written, I was lured into this den of iniquity and where, 
<laughs> after being, it was like stair school. And uh, instead of uh, being waterboarded, you use scotch. Yeah. And uh, yeah. after that, I, you know, I, I started making comments that were um, actually unseemly. Uh, unseemly. That's, this is yeah. what Blumenthal got hold of. And yeah. then there's a bunch of other stuff that happened. He didn't need to slow my voice down, but he did. And it, you know, did, um, and he made a big thing of it. Um, yeah. We can talk about Blumenthal later. Uh, but uh, his time in Russia and his Russian wife, I, I'm sure, came into bearing on that. And I opened the aperture by coming into this place and and uh, drinking hard liquid with you Th guys. That, that's what we do. But like well, like we we you know you, some men lure women with with rich mahogany and Corinthian leather and booze. We all of our leather bound books. Yes. Anyway, yes. okay, it was very look. I was a willing participant in that. Um, and but but remember the conversation. I, I just I want to make sure you're not blinking like doing an SOS. When you, I was a willing participant <laughs> in, in my last torture. Interview. Yeah, I know. Um, remember, circle. All right, stop it. Okay, back to Blumenthal. All right, remember our conversation though, guys. Yeah. Yeah. No, you don't. <laughs> you don't remember our conversation. I but remember, do you remember the context. Clipped. We were talking about war. Yeah. Okay. And and you know my point was, I, I mean, I I was in Iraq when Haditha happened, um, the the massacre, and I was in I wasn't in that battalion. But when you know when when the news started breaking, I knew in my heart of hearts that it happened. Okay. I've always been, and as have you guys, always been critical of your own government, of its policies when you felt they were wrong. Right. Of your own, even your own brothers in arms when they've done things. Right that we're wrong and that is that's the way we are right right so ukraine doesn't you know so it's the same for any any country right we will obviously um and if blumenthal had i mean if the the audience of uh of um it doesn't matter but you, again i played into it but my point is this the death threats that came afterwards a lot of them were from people who had nothing to do with the war i mean they were like all over Europe, I'm thinking, why are you angry about this? You, you know, and what's so weird? Like, I felt we tried to have a nuanced discussion. Well, it was totally nuanced, right? I mean, I was and like, and mm. we said, look, Russia is the aggressor. Yeah, Russia needs to be rolled back, and Ukraine has some messed up stuff about it too. But that doesn't justify what's going on. And and it's it's one of those situations where. Anybody who hasn't been in war can have this sort of this sort of black and white, you know, uh, perspective, especially when you're with I indigenous people, people who are fighting for their country. Yeah. Right. The emotions run high. Emotions run high. And, well, I mean, war generally. Right. I mean, that's that's the understatement to, to beat all understatements. Right. And the point is, unless you have unless you have some kind of. Uh, strong moral authority from the tactical level to the strategic level right that reminds them of what they're representing and why their buddies are dying and the values they're representing then everything goes to shit and that was my point and yeah. i stand by that point it was poorly worded and i'm now drinking yerba mate <laughs> instead of but the I point remains i don't think it was i i don't th i don't think in the i mean my personal opinion and by the, the way context, president Zelensky said uh, you know just a few months later he came out he's a he's an honest guy he came out and said hey we've got some problems and i intend to fix them right and you know why i mean he he said that he said that yes because he's always said that mm -hmm. but two because he understands that you can't play if you if you were saying i i want to evolve and i want to or evolve to be part of the the uh, nato or eu there are some things we have to do right. to fix within our house. Right. We've got this horrible thing going on right now, um, but we all know whatever happens to that. You know whether the offensive. I'm, I'm not jumping around topics here, guys. I mean, there's basically three things that can happen now with this offensive. Right? It can be it just strat It can be astonishingly successful, uh -huh. in which case the Russians end up divided. Uh, they're only south and east. And they're bottled up in Crimea, and the Ukrainians move uh, mass uh, enough, an unassailable amount of their combat power to within firing range of Crimea. That is the best case, right? 
Um, and then there's a second case where they can't break through, or they do break through, but they can't exploit it. And I'm talking about the main, you know, the, the Russian uh, positions. And then there's a third case that I will say will not happen, and that is the Russians counterattack, the, the, the offensive claim fails, the Russians counterattack, and they, they get in even more ground. But there's just not enough gas in the tank for the Russians to do that. We all hope, we are all praying that number one is the result, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. But, but even if, if that is the result, it, it's only going to keep Putin at bay if behind it is the assurance from the West you know, it's not going to be NATO membership right away, but there's got to be security right, right. assurances right. very visibly from from the West. Right. And that goes hand in hand. Right. Everyone understands, you know, that. Yeah, and those assurances have to be solid because yes. one could argue that Ukraine is in this situation because we, you know, are, because we made them denuclearize. Budapest, right? yeah. Budapest, they, they need something between Budapest and NATO. Right, uh -huh. Budapest didn't help them. Was it Budapest? The well, the agreement that where they the was it it I, where they surrendered all their in ninety two. Mm. Um, I thought it was called the Budapest Agreement, where they surrendered all their uh, nukes. Okay, yeah. Um, in return for an assurance of, well, you won't need them because right, you know, we've got your back. It wasn't right. hey, you were going to bring you into NATO or anything, but there was a security assurance. Right, right. Not as strong as the one we've given to Israel or Taiwan. But nevertheless, my point is, there's probably any, why not give them an assurance like we've given to Taiwan or Israel as an intermediary step, you know, to NATO. I mean, even Western, even Macron is looking this way now. Yeah. Yeah. This is what we're looking at like long term. And it's not anytime soon. We're talking about in the 2030s potentially being brought into the European Union. Yeah. That's and, right. And then that laying groundwork yeah. perhaps for NATO uh, eligibility. But they can't. But, but what he needs now, yes, hundred percent. What he needs now is to be able to say, he wants to say, or he wants. We're doing the right thing. Hey, yeah. hey, you're in the. You're going to be in the club, man. Mm -hmm. you, you're on the waiting list, and no one's going to fuck with you in the meantime. Mm -hmm. um, in order to do that, a lot of things have to be put in order, and they, right. and, they, and so none of those things that we have said should be taken as being there's there's a, a lot of and i i've encountered just a little bits and pieces of it you know here and there there's a lot of like rah rah for ukraine right now mm -hmm. in the west and i mean for some very good reasons but there are some people who let that kind of like blind them and they see it as a black and white issue mm -hmm. uh, where it, war is inherently about details and minutiae and these little nuances uh and not to not to blow off any issue or pretend it's not there to try to like you know, people try to nuance the issue or something to try to hide from it, but rather to confront it, right? Yeah. To say that, you know, yeah. this is a complicated thing and absolutely there are problems on the other side too. Yeah. And those things should be talked about and discussed openly and candidly. And uh, it, it doesn't mean any of us here are like uh, going to uh, go live in Moscow. Um, no. So I thought it was like a fairly adult conversation, but I mean, what did, you know, after we did that interview, you know, it, it blew up after it was clipped and by people who wanted to show, uh, you know, for propaganda value, let's just call it what it is. I mean, but what's your, your opinion, Andy, like how you felt when you saw some of those clips going around and some of the responses to it? Totally tight. It's, that's a great question, Jack. Um, just, I wouldn't just say in free fall, but at least in free fall, you don't feel like you're falling, right? <laughs> it's just, uh, you feel like you're on a cushion. Mm -hmm. So I felt like I'm, I suppose, I felt like I was in an elevator where the cable's being cut is the best, you know, and, and there's no one else. I, I know that sounds, that may sound absurd, mm -hmm. but think about it. People have killed themselves through, you know, attacks like that, right? right. I mean, they, right. it, it, lot, mm -hmm. reputation, everything else that goes with that. Um, and there was an element of me too that knew, yeah, I, I opened the door to that. Um, so it, it was a, it was an awful feeling. Mm -hmm. It was, uh, but I'm a, you know, I'm a big boy. Um, it, it made me think too, though. I said, when I'm a big boy, look, I, I was playing in a game, not playing a game. That's a horrible expression. I, I was in a, a venue. Mm -hmm. where where that was probably the kindest thing that was going to happen to me right right a lot of um, people are looking to take you out figuratively yeah. or, it, or literally it, it, exactly <laughs> so so you know i couldn't sit there and just go oh my god that's so you know wrong i mean 
Yeah, Blue Myth. I mean, we can talk about Blue Myth for a little bit. And I, uh, uh, but I, I, w what damaged me in my own eyes was I'd opened myself up to that. Not, oh, they did this to me. It was like, God, that, you know, I should have done that differently. Um, yeah. now, now I've moved past the self-blame. Here's a really interesting part of this. We, we are, and you guys are all, I know, intelligent. Um, and so you are. No, it, if you if you're thinking that was there was some pause when I said that it was when I looked at Dave. No, it's um. No, we just been we just been having a conversation about this. But let's talk about a. You know, just very quickly, AI. One of the scary things about AI. I mean, I there was some there was some reality truth at the at the basis of what Blumenthal did, right? Mm -hmm. But pretty soon we're gonna have we're gonna see politicians say things mm -hmm. on camera that they never said. Right. 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 And we've got to get used to that. And but that's not the scariest thing. The scariest thing is politicians can say and do things and say, "I never." What are you talking about? Right. Right. Can right. you imagine a politician ever saying that? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There's. Yeah. That's. Going I mean, to we be... are in a we're in a world where it, it's it, it's hit, hit. But yeah, I it brought me down. It 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 brought me. I mean, it really did. It brought me down like nothing. What what was going on as as all of that was kind of like snowballing in, yeah. in on social media? What was going on for you in the Mozart group in Ukraine at that time? Yeah, um, a lot of things. So, you know, I was pausing because there was a bang outside. <laughs> so I don't want to be melodramatic. When we talking about Ukraine and everything, I, it, it suddenly suddenly brought me back in into that, um, and I realized I probably spent the last three months not trying to forget but just you know going on with life it was a very yeah it was a it was a uh, we were being ripped asunder basically um it, we went from being an organization that was tight-knit competent um and based on mutual trust um to one that i mean we was was just basically ripped apart now we the i would say the core group of guys who i'm in contact with uh, you know, we, we all know what happened. Um, and it, it, it all comes down basically, and I'm not going to mention his name, you know, to, to the guy. Again, this gets back to, as General Nella, Commandant of the Marine Corps, used to tell me, when something goes wrong, you start at your own desk. <laughs> and, then you, and then you work in ever-expanding circles after you've, you've apportioned all the blame that you... And so plenty of blame. I, I went into that, I went into that with a rotten partner... But, you know, I wasn't founding a damn business. Right. I was responding to a request to train Ukrainian civilians to fight the Russians who were literally at the gates surrounding Kiev. That's not melodramatic. That's what I was doing. Right. The guy I was with at the time, who I needed, to be fair, saw this as a business. He didn't give a shit about Ukraine. He'd been there since the 90s um, and made a lot of money there. These are all facts. I don't mean he didn't give shit about Ukraine, who knows, but he made a lot of money there um, and that was his intention going forward. I think those are undisputed because you roll, go forward, fast forward, all right? Um, and again, this is me starting around my desk. You met Martin, right? Yeah. So the core group in the Mozart group were me and Martin, a fellow Marine, a guy named Wade, uh, Wade Pretty, uh, you may know, um, good guy, he's in debt one. I don't um, think so. Yeah, just an awesome dude. Um, and and then and then he whose name shall not be mentioned, mm -hmm. but you can look him up. Um, but me and Wade and, and Martin were having we found ourselves having too many conversations of this. Something's going on. You know, we're training dudes. I'm laughing now. It wasn't funny at the time. We're training dudes who have nothing to do with the Ukrainian military. We start to find out um, one day early on in the war. Uh, one of these guys cohorts one of the guys whose guys we were training left his bag in uh in in my in my room basically he you know he dropped by and i didn't know whose it was so i opened it there were it was packed full of dollars packed full and there was a brand new glock and now in ukraine a glock is a hanger i mean you can get ak's everywhere and mm -hmm. even m4s but a glock's a glock's a status symbol um i didn't count all the dollars but uh, you know, so so my point is, I, through my own naivety, in a sense, was we, we were already buttressed against um, losing control people who were not 
who were not who didn't have Ukraine at their best interests right. who were using the war to do other things. Right. I say naivety, but on the other hand, we're American dudes coming in trying to help um, these guys. We didn't know the the way you know the, the right. rules. What we did know, and I stand by, is and the, the Ukrainian soldiers um, who are the salt of the earth. Uh, and I'm not just saying that we we develop. We wouldn't have stayed there for a year if we didn't develop a huge. Um, there's no other word than affection for those guys. Mm-hmm. The guys who are volunteering continue to volunteer. Um, it's hard not to get emotional when you think about that. Um, and so everything else, everything else was. We wanted to pretend it was a distraction, but unfortunately, it was not a distraction. It, it was going to derail us. When I say we, it was it, that was my fault. Um, I didn't understand the the rules of the game. What what did those rules start to become as you as when, you discovered them? When well, when um, when we started to realize that, and and you've heard Martin say this too, um, and you can read the New York Times. So I'm not going to say anything that's not already in the media. Uh, there was an opacity opacity all right that it's not a big transparent word. it's yeah. a big word for well, a i think i could use the word like <laughs> opacity with your audience anyway there was just no transparency on donor funding coming in and this guy was our chief financial officer that was that was number one endless arguments but the problem is we still needed him right okay in fairness so it wasn't just naivety hey you guys we needed him because he right. had contacts um, infrastructure that we couldn't have survived without. Jack, you commented, hey, it's really difficult to start an organization like this. And you cannot do it unless you have a, some kind of anchor point. Right? I, I was, I was going to point out, you know, I this isn't maybe something to put on a resume, but like I've known a lot of mercenaries over the years. I've known a lot of people. We don't use the M word. I know we don't. I, I've also known a lot of people who are foreign volunteers, contractors, uh, I've known people who have gone overseas and to Syria, Iraq, and elsewhere trying to start up something like what you did. And I really admired how much you were able to accomplish over there and create a sort of cohesive group. And that you and Martin and these other guys were not like war junkies looking to get your kill on. It was something else. Like you were being more mature about it and going to try and offer training and mentorship for the guys who need it. Yeah. And I, I really respected that. And, um, I would say you got a lot further than most people I know. Well, but at the same time, I think like you, you ran into at a certain point the rules of the game. Like it's a messy world. Out there. It's it's a it's an incredibly messy world. So you can imagine the the only the only thing I, I can compare it to, I think, and I wasn't there, is the 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 breakup of Yugoslavia. And by that I mean, you know, we're used to Iraq and Afghanistan that were pretty closed theaters, right? I mean, they were I mean, yes. We had to deal with a couple of Italian bicycle tourists in Afghanistan, and there was occasionally some knucklehead who would think that Baghdad is, you know, a place where he could wander around and take photographs. But for the most part, those idiots stayed out of a place like right, that. Right. But if you have somewhere that, like Ukraine, uh, like um, uh, former Yugoslavia, that's very kind of European mm-hmm. feel, mm-hmm. it's not a closed theater. You've even got the president saying, "Hey, I'm going to form a foreign legion." You get the flotsam and the jetsam of the mm-hmm. world. You don't get, generally speaking, the guys who have a, a solid military resume, or you know, or have seen war, don't flock to a place like that. You know, I mean, the, that's one the guys, of the biggest misconceptions people have about that world. Yeah, exactly. That's exactly right. I mean, well, and that you're, yeah. you're going to have first world kit and you're going to have all this, yeah. all this air support. You're, you're going to have the, the people build up this vision in their mind when really it's running around with an, a rusty Kalashnikov in a third world country. And, and there's Who's no. Mike? Okay. okay. Who's Mike? Oh, okay. Is it, is it giving me an English accent or yeah. something? Yeah. We're going to have to tape test you. <laughs> your, your neck, you got yeah, bull neck. neck. <laughs> uh, where were we? before about the messy world yeah the messy world yes you know i mean we the walter so the brits called them walter mitties right yeah Yeah, yeah, yeah. you know um which is interesting because james thurber was an american playwright james thurber wrote um thurber's carnival right and walter mitty was a character in thurber's carnival who's always pretending to be something for some reason 
the Brits picked up on that. But if you mention Walter Mitty and United, no one's no one remembers it's, James. It's Dunn. always like that, man. Every case study you look at, yeah. it's uh, you know the guy who got kicked out of the Foreign <laughs> Legion. It's you know in oh my uh, god. Looking back, like in Angola, where like one guy who showed up to fight the war was a street sweeper, you know. That's like, right. That kind of yeah, yeah. And we're going to come back to that, but I want to follow through with your excellent questions. Um, so that was th those are all indicators, mm -hmm. and then this, all right. Um, at this at, by November, mid-November, we had kind of decided that this was untenable. You know, even if we were going to collapse and die we needed to to break with this guy he helped us along a little bit because uh, by coming to me and this again the new york times and saying um i want to andy i i want to leave and um you know so sorry dude we're gonna miss you um but you need to buy me out okay you know i was thinking maybe what we paid for the sandwiches just now five million dollars um that is the new york times you can look it up where the, where the hell are we going to get $5 million? Right. And even if we did, it would be illegal from donor funding to give it to this dude. So it's just, so yes, I was naive, but um, we're dealing with people who are um, not necessarily wired. War, war zones attract that type yeah. of personality. Yeah. Well, they, he was already there. Yeah. But to, the, to your point, anyway, the, to, which is a very interesting point about the, the, the war zone, an open war zone. Um, and, and the Ukrainians have, have sadly learned this lesson with their legion. Uh, I'm not going to knock the legion because they have a tremendous amount of very brave, very capable guys who did volunteer and continue to serve with the legion. But they've had problems, too. Any, anyone who's in the legion will tell you all the problems that they have had mm -hmm. with the flotsam and jetsam. I've sat in a bar in Kiev and watched dudes carry, you know, with drop holsters and sniper rifles drink themselves into oblivion and throw up. And you know they've never walked outside Kiev. I know for a fact they've yeah. never walked outside yeah. Kiev. And that continued, you know, so we attract, it, you know, it attracts the, those sort of people. And we had a few towards the end in the Mozart group, not, you know, and that was part, um, as you get bigger and bigger, right. um, that's part of the problem. Right. And again, as I look back at how, you know, things, I would have changed. I'm never going to start an organization like that again, but that would be one of those things. But at the same time, you can't, you know, I'm, I was trying to bring in donor funding, everything you did. Something's going to give in that environment. And sure enough, yeah. I mean, so we had a few, we had a few, um, very few bullshitters come in. Um, a lot of guys now are claiming to have been in the Mozart group. I noticed that online. Uh, there's even, um, you guys can look this up. There's an even, uh, a place in Bulgaria run by a Brit, um, Simon Feek. It's called Prep U, and it claims to have Mozart Group, cadre of Mozart Group training. You know exactly experience experience what it's like on the front in Ukraine. <laughs> and I'm looking at his line of characters. None of those dudes was anywhere near the front. A couple of them did work for us, but their names I remember because they were the guys who said, "No, I'm going to do training. I'm not yeah, doing yeah. evacuations." Because, you know, getting back to what we were doing, and, and Jack, this plays into what you were saying. You, you, yes, you need funding, but you also need a niche to, to be able to tell donors, why, why should I give to you? What are you doing right, right. that's so different? So what we did, we did very high-risk evacuations. We didn't, we didn't say, oh, we're going to do high-risk evacu or evacuations out of Barkmoot or beyond Bankmert, when Bankmert was a safety area, which just gives you an indication of the high, how, high risk. We would take, we would take a detain, I mean, detainees, oh my God, <laughs> wrong wall. Uh, we would take evacuees yeah. from towns beyond Bankmert into Bankmert as a, as a safe haven. All right, that gives you an idea of, you know, uh, because there was a need. Right. The Ukrainians couldn't do it. The, the military was fighting for their lives. Right. And yet, and, and so, number one, number two, we were training Ukrainian soldiers near the front. Yeah. Because um, no shortage of volunteers. The sad thing is, a lot of guys who, who would have been trainers had volunteered early in the war and had become casualties. And now they're, they're training institutions who are empty, at least when we were out there. I know the Ukrainians are fixing this. Um, so there was a there was an absolute critical need, and we were there for a year to help that. But it was a very, if you want to use the term high stress, of course, by by nature of it, 
we weren't war junkies. I'm proud of that. We were very careful. If we had guys um, we felt were just there for the adrenaline To rush. get some. But you know what, guys? Here's what I noticed there. The guy who comes in is an adrenaline junkie. He wants to get his gun on. or uh, he, he doesn't want any part of what was happening there. One, you know, it, it would take one far for effect. Or one, <laughs> and he's like, I'm done. I yeah. better. So, so, so we had a lot of guys, though, who are really solid guys. But they knew how I will train. I'm just going to train. And that was not risk-free. That was in Donbass. It was within artillery range of the Russians. Mm -hmm. But it wasn't the, you know, kind of really high-risk stuff of driving into direct fire of the Russians. And we were fired up a couple of times in BMPs. Um, so, so there was, again, where I'm getting this point is um, you, you could choose your place within the organization. But there was nothing that was risk-free. But there was no room to be a pretender. Right. 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 You know, you couldn't. And, and that's, I was, that's just the way it, it kind of fell out. Um, as things fell apart, now I look back, guys, and I'm really, I just, I, I've always struggled in my life, uh, or at least post school. Um, you're going to get complaints about this, but I've always struggled with belief in a kind of divine entity. You know, maybe like a lot of us who've seen all this horrible shit happen in the world, it's hard to correlate any anyone in charge, right? Yeah. <laughs> who in who in charge of all this would allow this stuff to happen? I've always, I, I've changed that. I've changed my views drastically, and I do, I do, you know, believe that there is a, a good. Um, I, I don't know how, you, how I want to. Sort of like a benevolence. Somewhere. Yes, there is a God. Okay, yeah. all right, uh, absolutely. But but nevertheless, what we were dealing there with there was such a. It, it was so draining for anyone who mm -hmm. who has any sense of anything, and it wasn't just civilian casualties. It was the poor dudes who were volunteering, and 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 we could drive in and out. And those guys were in trenches every single day. Um, not a lot of top cover. Um, you know their trenches were not. What do you do to, to shelter from that kind of artillery? You either move or you dig deep uh -huh. or you disperse. Uh -huh. You've got those three choices, right? The Ukrainians didn't have any of those three choices. That's uh -huh. why they took um, such horrendous casualties uh, during, during that period. Um, that I found heartbreaking. Yeah. Um, I find Russian casualties heartbreaking. You know, we talked about this. I don't watch videos of Russians getting blown up. I, someone sent me a video of a, of a drone chasing a Russian soldier the other day, and then he looks up and he tries to surrender, and he gets killed. Uh -huh. And I found myself getting choked up watching that because he's as much a... I, I relate more to him than the dude who sent me that. Right, you know? right. Um, yeah. Anyway, the, my point is I'm... All the, all the guys, anything that for which I'm proud of what we did, I'm proud of the, the people that we helped, I'm very glad that none of our guys were, were killed, but that is a very superficial type of pride because some of them remained and were killed. Yeah. Um, so I'm, I'm, I guess I'm, I, I'm not coming to any logical conclusion except it's... It's a shit situation. It couldn't have continued. Yeah. What we were doing couldn't have continued yeah. without bad things happening to a lot of good people. Yeah. And... Uh, what, what, so when it... When this is why I'm asking you guys to ask the questions because I was like, no, it, very, it, very inarticulate. No, <laughs> no, and you have a lot of conflicted feelings about it. Yeah, which I yeah, think, yeah. I think everyone involved probably. Does. You know, and, yeah. and and you're right. Like there, there are people on both sides that are are watching these, watching these shows like Kill TV. Yeah. Um, and it's cheering it on in in kind of a gross way. I hate it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I I mean it's. I, I've always hated that, actually. I've, I've never... I mean, we, we've all get, got to get through... It, looking back at what we did, you know, in our profession, um, of course, it's about killing, killing the bad enemy. guys, yeah. Of course it is. So I'm not, you know, I'm not being... I'm not being hypocritical, but I think there's a difference between that and then rejoicing in it. You know, I, I thought that... I think that part is... It doesn't matter how bad you think they are... And even like watching, you know, of course we killed thousands and thousands of Islamic State dudes when I was in the siege of Sodif. Right. Of course, that was our job. 
but it doesn't. I never sent people videos of it. Right. I mean, right. I just don't understand that. I don't. It's when, not entertainment. What was the beginning of the end for you? Like where you knew that was the end of most art group. Um. It's a really good question, Dave. In fact, all your questions are very good. And I like the way you've shaved your beard um, and the color, too. Thank you. So I'm thinking about So I don't need the... <laughs> no, I, I don't need no, the I, um, I, you, know, you know what's... I, I think... Have you guys ever been in a position where you just couldn't... You, you were so caught up in something... You, you couldn't step back and get a good perspective. Yeah, right? you can't see the forest for the trees. Yeah, yeah. I, I was there. And, and so problem would pop up because um, we had some we had some internal stuff back in the States too uh, going wrong then too. The problem, whenever you have an organization that's running like that and accruing attention, media attention, you're going to get people who want to be part of the organization but not to add to it but to reflect their own. Right. You know, so... Anyway, my point is that a problem would pop up. I'd feel, or we'd feel, okay, I fixed that, uh, and then something else, and then finally, um, I don't think there was a single point. I think it was just, it just became too difficult. You know, our, our vehicles, um, our vehicles were rounded up. This is our vehicles that we were using to evacuate civilians were were uh, impounded by this guy. Oh, right. Shit. By the guy, by, yeah. by the guy in the Mozart group, yeah, yeah. For what reason were they impounded? Like, how did? Why did he? Well, he he his name was on the on on the paperwork. Now, as co-owner of the Mozart group, but only he speaks Ukrainian, and it, you know he's got a lawyer henchman. So it, you know what I'm saying. Yeah. So I'm not suggesting that he paid anyone off. I'm just saying that our vehicles were impounded. And a lot of civilians could not be, you know, civilians undoubtedly died because our vehicles were sitting in Kiev and pounded by him. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. When that starts happening, yeah. I'm thinking, what the hell are we doing? Right. But it took, you know, uh, what, what are we, we're fighting to get vehicles released in order to save the citizens of the country. I mean, it, it's... Did you ever think there was the possibility, um, and I, I don't want to you know, throw out alleg allegations, I guess it's just a thought exercise, of split loyalties there? Or why would somebody intentionally uh, try to impede? Uh, Dave, I, there's, anything I say is speculation. Okay. Um, he's bad, you know. I, one thing, I, I've done an enormous amount of, of learning self-growth in this, which I know Jack, early on told me there's no such when the colonel says I'm learning he's full of shit <laughs> um, but but I have I've learned I've learned more in the last year and a half than maybe 15 years or 30 years in the Marine Corps not quite that but it, it's certainly a very accelerated learning process but what I one thing I've learned is it, you can't speculate about other people's motivations and you cannot get you cannot allow their motivations to piss you off because there's no end to it, right? And that's why I'm absolutely without anger right now. I mean it. Yeah. You know? um, he will, I do believe there's some kind of karma. I do believe that he and some of these other people who are involved in this will meet their, their end. It's not my part to bring it around. What am I going to do, sit here and rail about them? No, I think the important thing here, and you're, you know, your subscribers, your audience probably don't want to, him he use this as a platform to hit back at people i think uh, i think the experience is interesting um the petri dish of uh of ukraine of a war zone the people it attracts how to navigate your way through all these are interesting topics but i can't rail about i don't know yeah it's a horrible thought it's yeah. impossible now uh, we had heard rumors and maybe you can confirm or deny these that at one point in time <laughs> that or not, or just simply that, say nothing. That, that somebody had attempted to sell half of the Mozarts group to Afghanistan, the, to, the, the Taliban. to the Taliban. Yeah. So this is um, the, a good friend of mine. Not a good friend of mine sold the Mozart group to the Taliban. But um, yeah, it's the same guy was involved in that. A good friend of mine wrote an article about it on Substack. Um, Jeff, Jeff uh, Carr. 
Jeff's probably listening now. Um, and he it's a well researched article. But yeah, the yeah, I forgot. You know, see, I forgot even about that. The same guy, because <laughs> he couldn't get five million from us, and then apparently, um, and and there is some evidence to support this went to the government in in Afghanistan, which was still sanctioned um, to try and raise five million. They, you know, it does hurt me. I mean, I've got a lot of reasons to hate the Taliban, but now even more so that they weren't interested. They weren't going to pay five million dollars to 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 partner with me in the Mozart group. It's crazy. I mean, that would have been. <laughs> You can't make this stuff up. I mean, it's just oh, surreal. No, it is. You can't make it up. That's that's what I mean. I mean, I am writing a book. Um, I've got a very kind agent uh, who's guiding me through the process. But the the, the stories within the stories, are like, I mean, what do you? I mean, it it's almost like the in the end, he gave me great advice. He said, "This is a series of episodes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> because, you know, just just." spill them out this is the, the andy yeah. milburn web redemption oh gosh well i mean i'll say because no, because you've written a book when the tempest gathers which which comes out in paperback wait it's a phenomenal book At the end of the, um end end of this month yeah 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 it's a phenomenal book and Thank i highly you. recommend it to anybody because and we've talked about this on the show before that um it's it's very moving be, because one of the things i think that there there are a lot of books about the wars written there are a lot of books about you know, autobiographies about their people's time and service. But one of the things that really struck me about your book is how reflective you were. Um, Too much so for a Marine. Is that what you're about? <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I would say, you know, like a millennial Marine. May no, no, I'm just kidding. Um, no, but... It, I'm but a philosophy graduate. As, you know that, David? as, you know, a... Philosophy and law. A leader in war, you know, you really gave voice to the doubts that you had, you know, to, am I making the right decision here? Am I sending guys to their death here? Like those, those are very challenging questions for a leader during war. And I think that a lot of leaders just sort of try to shut that down because mm. yeah. nobody wants to like yeah. knowingly send people to death possibly. Uh, Dave, that's great. Uh, okay. I keep telling you, I, I've got to, I've got to stop. Andy well, we have a crush it. on you too, Andy. So yeah, I, know, I mean, <laughs> pour it on. Um, no, that's a that's a really that's a, that's a great point. So, you want a leader who questions himself without without sinking into paralysis, because we've all worked for the other sort of leader who is constantly paralyzed. And normally, when he's paralyzed, though, it's not questions about his guy. It's more about his career. Right. It's more about um, what is going to what yeah. what are they going to say up top? But I'll give you you know, I, so I'm not even. It's as a trainer watching the dynamics within units that come through. I see time and again commanders who 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 are struggling with this. Not not I don't see criminals. I see guys who are. Oh my god! You know I just lost half a battalion. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't want to do that again. Can you train help? You know, but from the guys, a lot of times it seems unfeeling. Mm -hmm. Because now I'm looking at it from their point of view, and they're like, "Dude, we we attacked that village five fucking times," and he he's you know, but I realized the pressures that he was under, and the you know, I it, it gets back to very very you know, which is a very basic point, right? That one of you two made um, today in Twitter. Yeah, the war is just fucking horrible. And yeah, that's one of the worst things as a commander. So if you're a commander. And you love the fact that you've got your name on a coffee cup and you don't have to look for a parking place for your first time in the Marine Corps or Army, right? It's right there. And your wife, fiance, boyfriend, whatever comes to, you know, change. I mean, it's all this, wow, this is so fucking great. And you got you can never forget you're just a steward. This mm -hmm. is not about you. Because as, as we all know, when you go to combat, every single death does weigh on you, but at the same time you've got to do the things that you need to do. So I'll give you a very quick example. See, anything I'm just like waxing lyrical and, uh, about the shit. In um, 2009 in Iraq, uh, do you remember? You know, the the mantra then was, "Hey, it's you know, hand everything over to the Iraqis. Mm -hmm. It's going to be their war. Mm -hmm. it, it's a rockify the war." It's a, you know, mm -hmm. remember it, it's kind of a, a 
uh, reminder of venomization. Um, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And so we were working hard to do that in Anbar province, at least. Uh, it was an uphill struggle at times, um, but we genuinely wanted that to, to happen. Uh, but I, I was in the shithole of Anbar province, and anyone who uh, has been to Anbar province will recognize I'm not exaggerating. So Anbar province is a shithole of, of Iraq. Um, and karma is a share. And if you're Iraqi, this is not a criticism of Iraq as a country, which I understand that is a very beautiful country. Karma, all right? Ironic. Worst place, worst place of Iraq. So karma refused to be a good place. Uh, <laughs> my, my predecessor, the guy I took over from, was killed there. Uh, Max Gallier is the only battalion commander to have been lost in Iraq. Um, and it just continued to foment and um, throughout all this... Iraqification process. So, so I, I said, listen, we've got to go in, and I know this sounds like such a, a cliche. We're going to clear karma once and for all, right? Remember that coordinate search and go in and take all their weapons, so no one can do this shit again. And how many coordinates and searches did we do? It was like, it was like, uh, I don't know, I'm trying to think of an analogy, but the coordinates were like, you, you're forming cordons with, with vehicles. Mm -hmm. And we fooled ourselves. So if we just move at night into form a cordon. Bottom line is, how many, how, much, how many real bad guys do you catch during one of those cordon, battalion cordons? No one, nothing. Mm -hmm. But I was just frustrated. You know? So we go um, in my heart, and I'm briefing to the regimental commander, and he's like, Andy, it should be the Iraqis doing this. And I'm like, sir, who's going to go into karma and do this? And he's like, all right, it's your last, last, defense, last stop. Well, we lose the Marine on that. Um, a guy named TJ Riley is uh, 21 years old. He, he, uh, um, his, uh, uh, his Humvee was hit by, um, what, what are the Iranian grenades that you throw and it goes into a shape charge, they were right? RKG-33s. Uh, RKG RKG-33s. They yeah. were EFP hand grenades. Yeah. So it was the first time we'd seen one of these things. It went straight through the top of the, his Humvee, wounded everyone else, and took his head off. Um, I know for a fact he'd be alive if I hadn't given that order. Mm -hmm. And I, and what what did that order achieve? Mm -hmm. You know, nothing. Mm -hmm. And again, and, and a guy's dead. You know, and I I obviously met his mother and his sister, and um, I learned like all of us who are commanders, you learn more about your Marines or soldiers after their deaths than you do during their lives. I'll never forget that. I don't know it's a wrong decision. You know, I don't even know if I can tell you I regret that decision because it was at the time the right one. Right. I do. I'm desperately sorry that he is dead. Yeah. You know, so multiply that by tens, twenties, thousands. I understand. Right. The, you know, the, the weight of this, um, not, and, and I'm not, I'd be the last one to be critical of Ukrainian commanders for taking casualties because they, they've got a horrible Hobson's choice. Right. You know? Right. Um, I don't know how we go on this topic. Well, but, but, but your, your, your question. Then. But I remember like some of the some of the offhand comments, um, you know, about our show was, oh, you have to teach people not to commit or not to commit, you know, like uh, war crimes during war. It's like, yeah, you do. Like you have to give classes. You have to give counseling. Like if you think that your hometown got invaded yeah. and then you were just going to go out there and and um not want payback yeah like i don't i don't you live you live in a world that you're very fortunate to live Wait. in if you don't have to wrestle with that idea in in, a, in iraq and afghanistan they were shitty wars they were pointless fucking worthless wars you know and i'm sure you read you'll have readers complain about me saying that i was like you guys were deeply involved in both of them mm -hmm. but they were worthless worthless wars mm -hmm. i mean who can say otherwise yeah I right mean, look at afghanistan uh, look at iraq mm -hmm. look who's in um they've just named uh they've just named a construction company the biggest iraqi construction company after mohamdas the guy who was taken out in the drone strike 2020 the pmu guy yeah so i mean the the 
Iranian, I mean, <laughs> the Iraqi government right now. I mean, look who is in the government right now. They're mm -hmm. all they're all PMC dudes, right. or pro-Iranian. The Sunnis have given up there, right? Right. So who knows what's happening to those poor bastards right. now? Um, it's so what was it all for? My point is that as bitter as those all we had, all we had was the fact that we represented our values. Right. And all we had were the guys with us represented those values too. Right. Even the Indians and, who were with us. Yeah. Represented. No, absolutely. Us. All, yeah. Yeah. And and so that was why that was very important. Yeah. Now totally different I mean, same principles. Different dynamic when you, it depend everything, the scale slides totally when you've got your family mm -hmm. and, and behind you, mm -hmm. right? Your your personal risk calculus changes, mm -hmm. right? Right. You don't. <laughs> right. I mean, in a counterinsurgency, it's a little bit different. You you get a lot of guys who are crazy. Some guys who are crazy brave, but in the end, everyone wants to live. Right. But in a war like this, you've got guys who are absolutely willing to die, mm -hmm. and they're not zealots. Right. They're not suicide bombers. They're dying because the choice, you know, that that's what they feel really is their obligation in order to defend their families. And right. that is, uh, I find that immensely poignant. But what I find even more poignant is it's the guys who, who feel that way are the guys that any country can least afford to lose. Right. Because they're always going to be a percentage of any country's population who don't want to do shit. Right. 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 And, and don't care about that and want someone else to do the fighting. Right. And, and that is my concern for Ukraine right now is they've got, they've had no shortage of awesome dudes, very brave, but, they, but it's not, it's not an inexhaustible stock. Right. 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 So no, it's, um, yeah, I, none of us have been there, right? None of us have had to, defend our families no. from tanks rolling into our town. Can you, you know? can you hear that? Yeah. 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 All right. Tell me it's not artillery fire. <laughs> no, it's, it's, um, we have a weight room next door and oh, somebody, is somebody okay. dropping, is somebody dropping weights? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, tell it, make them stop it, Dave. And I would like to, you know, at one point, um, talk about what you just mentioned, kind of like, is the war sustainable and where we're at today, sure. what the current offensive looks like. Before we get there, I would like to ask you to kind of complete your story as far as like what were the last weeks and days leading up to your exit from Ukraine? What what was that like for you? What you experienced? Um, you know, honestly, Jack, I'm not making this up, but it, a lot of it was just a blur. Yeah. Um, the the one thing, the one thing that really solidified for me was. Um, there's, there is a point where, there is a point, you know, we're all taught you have agency, right? You know, and, and so it does, and we've all learned, I mean, in our cultures, even in the army, uh, SF, um, that all of us are problem solvers. Um, and, and all of us pride ourselves on that, that's a generalization. Uh, I just, I felt, I just lost my ability to affect, you know, to a point I was like, okay, I don't mind how many problems you bring. I think we can solve them. And then I said, fuck man, yeah, uh, I'm done. And, and then the sad thing after that, after saying I'm done, everyone's like, Andy, let's start it up again. Let's do this. Let's do that. And I just, I felt like I was disappointing so many people mm. by saying, no, we, we're done. You know, we, we are, there's, there's, you know, I won't go into it all, but, um, I don't know. I it, it was a huge blow. Um, I went to England, uh, where I saw you know have family. Um, I needed cataract surgery badly by then. By the way, guys, if you don't delay cataract surgery, I was almost blind by then. You know, um, which is I think helped in in Donbass because you could <laughs> if you couldn't if you could I'd, I'd be uh, much more scared now if I could yeah. see things clearly. Well, yeah. holy shit, man. Yeah. That's scary. Um, so I ended up in London uh, to, to get my eyes fixed and, and um, visit my sister. Um, and it was a great time in a sense of just getting my breath back, you know, a chance to think about things. And then I came back here. 
answer is, Jack, I, I don't know. I'm still processing. Mm -hmm. I think the hardest... Hey, listen, it, this... Of course, um, the organization had to be out in the open. There had to be a lot of going online to get funding and everything. So I think probably those people thought that I really enjoyed doing that. Actually, I did not. I didn't. I hated the donor raising. It was just raising. part of what you I hated do, the yeah. kind of the prostituting. <laughs> I hated it. I felt, you know, but we needed to do that to right. bring in... Um, I, yeah. It was a relief. Now that part it was, it was all, the, all that media exposure is like this double-edged sword, right? Of course, yeah, of course, yeah. And and so I knew that, um, and that takes us to you know, the, uh, uh, in, like we talked about, um, you, you're a you're a journalist, and you just like in the military, we've got good good and bad people sure. who represent our profession. Same thing in journalism, but you know, even the even the people who are what we call you know think of as dicks but are, are still competent journalists are, are filling a really good function, watchdog of democracy. It's, an, it's, it's absolutely important. But you can never get lulled into thinking, oh, wow, you know, it's under media attention because there's always a backside of that. And right. there were certainly, you know, I used to, uh, um, I gave you one example um, uh, of someone who was very, you know, shark circling very, <laughs> as soon as there's blood in the water, he moved in. Uh, but I, I created, you know, I, in a sense, I, I created that environment where they could do that. I can't then turn around and say, hey, man, that was so unfair. I, I created that environment. But I created that environment because how else are we going to raise fucking money? Right. That's, you know, I had guys from the agency, hey, Andy, you need to move back into the shadows. Like, dude, you could work in the shadows because you never had to worry about right. money, right, right, Dave? Right. Yeah. I mean, if you lost a bit of some kit, did someone come on after you with a... Uh, you know, to reimburse the government or anything like that. You right. Know what I mean? Right. Yeah. So it was. I couldn't be in the shadows, and I and frankly, I was scared. I was. I. I was scared too because I knew I. I, I was so visible. Um, I know this may sound melodramatic to you, but there's that. Um, who's a guy who? Uh, some. Uh, American businessman um, worked in Russia, Ukraine. Jumped off a building here in D.C. a couple of years ago. Oh, I, I do remember yeah. what you're talking about, but I don't recall his name, I'm afraid. Yeah. Anyway, his son, you know, reached out to me uh, just because he wanted to help support Mozart Group. Then his school told him he couldn't, um, which is kind of sad. But, you know, all that. So. So all of this coming together, there's a lot of questions, of course, whether we really did jump is, you know, I mean. Right. Um, the Russians have a long reach. I may not. Initially, for a long time, I thought, they don't give a shit about me. I'm so low. But then I thought, no, they probably, just for the fun of it, might. When, uh, you know, you uh, while you were gone, you let me stay at your house when I was visiting Gosh. Tampa. Uh, I was down there for soft week, staying at your place. And when I come home, I come to your, ha I come to your house at the end of a long day. It's like 11 o'clock at night. And I'm like, mm -hmm, walking up to your front door, and there's a package. And it's all like, <laughs> it's all like busted up. Like it had a rough ride in the mail. But there's a box like this, and it's all like busted out. I wonder, is that why you got an early flight? And, and I'm looking, and I'm looking at it. I'm kind of like walking around, like I'm some like half-assed EOD guy. Like, mm, I don't know. Like, does this have Russian stamps on it? Like, it, it was, you can see how Jack cares about so, me, right? So, so there's He's a package. My there's, He's sleeping in my bed. Yeah, there's a package in your backyard that he wants to tell you about. <laughs> it's, He's uh, telling uh, me about it now. Yeah, yeah. I mean, well, I've been back in the house after after a, a thorough examination. I brought it inside. It was a uh, it was a uh, water softener. Oh, it was like the salt or whatever. Yeah, that yeah, that does look pretty water. scary, doesn't it? From, from the outside, I'm like, oh, this is like. Return, I mean, if I was like if the I, return seriously. address is the Wagner Group in St. Petersburg. Oh, like, yeah, oh, if I was the GRU. Novichok <laughs> or water softener yeah. are the two quick ways to... Yeah. I just didn't feel like taking your bullet. That's no, all. I, I've, yeah, no, I... No, I... Was, I love you, but I wasn't going to jump on that. I, I just got scared when you started talking in open forum about staying in my house in Tampa. That's not necessarily where I live, everyone. When he said Tampa, it could be anywhere in the United States. <laughs> but It's uh, definitely not Des Moines, so don't... And, that's, and, and by the way, that's the only reason why, you know, very... Happy developments in my own personal life, um, but I don't talk about them publicly because of that. Because I don't, sure, you know, I mean, I get it. So, uh, you know, I, what, I, you, if you, I'm you, sounding paranoid, or 
bear with me. Andy, if you want to plug your OnlyFans page, you can do it here. We don't mind. I, <laughs> there, there's, I think there's been multiple requests for you to take your shirt off again. So No, um, I can't do that. But please, uh, so now we're talking about Substack. We weren't talking about Substack, yes. but we're going to talk about it now. Please do. Uh, if you're interested in everything, anything I say, my subscriptions are free, unlike Jack's, who you have to pay for. <laughs> At some stage, though, I want to say that I do want to become like Jack, only in that way. So, um, not not in the way of casually using a friend's house and then ignoring danger to his. So let, <laughs> his, let's his life or property. Let's talk. Sorry, no, yeah. no, that's fine. No, but, bring it back to a serious. Note, yeah, please. no, I, we we're very serious yeah. here on the team house, as you know, Usually. we as yeah. as we as we get our guests drunk and, and make them expose the, the in our, in our living room desires. setting yes um let, are, you, let, are you getting questions online uh not yet people are just like rant you know chanting Ranting. they're chatting um is everyone going to complain if i go for a pee in a little bit no yes someone okay. will complain yeah. okay go i ahead. mean whatever let let's talk about like what happened with what was it? The New York Times that started the Max Blumenthal thing, or was it Max? No, Blumenthal? no, 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 no. Let me. Yeah, let me. Uh, so, so um, Max Blumenthal. I, you know, this all this came out while uh, my my. You know, I hate to use the term my partner because it makes it sound like some romantic relationship, but um, in the Mozart group, the, the the dude, the bad actor. Yeah. Well, as he was unraveling stuff, so I so I was only paying half attention. To what Bloomer thought, I, I noticed all the hate mail, but that's not unusual for right. me. Right. Um, but but even <laughs> that was a joke, all right. But at some point, the hate mail reached a crescendo where I felt compelled <laughs> to pay attention to it. Right. All right. Hate mail turning into a lot of death threats, and I'm thinking, why is everyone so pissed off? And then I saw a, a Blumenthal say that videos had two million views. You know, I didn't know Blumenthal. I had no idea. He didn't even link our video, which is kind of bullshit. I'd yeah, say. Yeah, no, no, it's, it's you know, dude. <laughs> I mean, all you have to do is look at his background. For Christ's sake, he lived in Russia. His wife's Russian. Right. He's done part-time work for RT. Right. I mean, he he is. <sighs> He, he's not an independent observer who decided, <laughs> right. oh, my God, Andy Melbourne needs to go on the wagon, right. you know, which is his comment. It's right. like, well, thank you so much, dude. Yeah. I, I will remember you in the 12-step program. But, yeah. You know, yeah. In the meantime, go back to Russia. Yeah. Um, anyway, so all this was – so I started like – and it, it really picked up uh, momentum. I was told, hey, the Ukrainians are going to be really angry. But actually – absent from all this chorus of anger was a single comment by a soldier a ukrainian soldier or anyone in the military angry at me they right. got bigger fish to fry right well not only that they're like hey it's the russians what the fuck do you expect yeah, right yeah. this is the way they operate right right i mean look at what's happened to other dudes who run organizations right of course you're going to get attacked and what they took what what max blumenthal and, and others did is they took a three-hour conversation about the nuance and, and by the, the way he's appeared on it several times this was this was a vehicle for him oh yeah in russia he to talk again and again about me and that which says a lot about yeah, yeah. and 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 they you know you we talked about the challenges that ukraine has as a country yeah. and and they're like oh here here's this you know a drunken soldier, you know, talking about, soldier. you know, yeah, I know. I mean, I'm not upset about you calling me drunken. Right. It's soldier. the soldier bit. Yeah. Right. <laughs> oh, right. Jeez. Yeah. Uh, you know, here's this, you know, drunk. Well, yeah. you know, uh, talking like, about about all these friend about all the who works for Ukraine, who's talk about the problems. Of Ukraine. Oh. It's like, yeah, like we can talk about that and still say that, you know, Putin and the Russian government are shit for the invasion that yeah. like. You know, and it, there's there's this whole brand of like far out there, just off the rails. Oh uh, I, I don't even want to call them left wingers. I mean, they're they're just off the rails lunatics. And but they converge with extreme right wing too. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. They, I it, mean, it's the Blumenthal's of the world, the Peter Moss from Intercept. Yeah. And guys like Tucker Carlson. In that weirdness, they come yeah, around it, like it, this. It's that it's that yeah. horseshoe theory. It's this, it, it, it's it's that this horseshoe interesting, theory. like you know, Western imperialism bad. 
Eastern imperialism. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes, exactly. yeah. Yeah. You know, it's like, I don't, I don't, yeah, there's, they're not, they're not guided by any sort of like principle or anything. If you're well, like logic train, if you're just anti-war, you're like full stop anti-war. I know some like far lefty people who are like, just they're anti-war. That's of course. who they are. Yeah. Of course. It's like, who well, wouldn't be? okay. You have a, you have a, uh, a perspective and you know, you're true to it. Yeah. I, res I respect that. Mm -hmm. You're a pacifist, but these guys are not that. Yeah. 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 They're not at all. It's a very, it's a platform for the sake of having a platform. It's very difficult to, you know, you take, I mean, a guy like, uh, oh yeah, let's stop talking about Peter Ma You know, Peter, I mean, let's stop, stop talking about Blumenthal for okay. a moment. Let's take Peter Mars at The Intercept, right? Okay. Okay, so I told you the story. Um, a Marine a Marine goes missing. Is Jack really changing his socks? Oh, yeah, he's not wearing. I'm not wearing socks. Okay, all right. I was worried for a moment. Jack's going to the restroom. I, I was midway through answering a, a, a very good question, and he's gone to the I'm restroom. I'm he's got 35 subscribers, 3,500 subscribers. Okay, I'm, I'm back. A big deal in some quarters, you're you're a I'll huge have, deal. Okay, let's anyway. Peter Moss. So, Marine goes missing. I forget exactly when it was. It was, and I, I won't mention his uh, his name. It doesn't matter now. Um, and Peter Moss from the Intercept call or contacts me saying. He's dug up shit on this guy's during his career in the Marine Corps. This guy got in trouble. Can you imagine that in the Marine Corps? Yeah, it's, yeah, right, uh, yeah. right. Um, got a uh, bad conduct discharge, or um, no, or a conduct under other than honorable. Uh, other than yeah. honorable. Um, well, at the same time, this guy's family had asked us to help track him down, and you know, and and Mars is generating this article that's going to say this guy was a shitbag, blah, right. blah blah. I'm like, dude. What the fuck, man? We, it, it, how, how, how you represent yourself as your watchdog of democracy digging up shit. So my point there um, was simply that, yes, you have journalists who should be fulfilling a role and reporting. You may not like it. You and I may not always like it, but they need to be there. Right. But when you get a guy who's simply just generating shit that's going to cause people heartbreak right. and add to their heartbreak right. or salt in the wound right. for the sake of selling stuff that that is you know that that's getting off the platform right and and so a guy like Moss who probably the height of his career wrote the toppling 20 uh, came out in 2010 in the New Yorker he made you know it was a big deal for him it was the, but that was the high watermark of his career and then right. he made it the intercept and then he suddenly the, well, he, and he came after me with a vengeance after that so, oh really yeah um, well, yeah, and the Intercept, yeah, the Intercept. I don't, don't even look at. It. You can look up the Intercept article about this whole the Mozart group. Um, very badly wit written, very badly researched. But the point is, again, I brought that on, you know, um, and and I think I think I let it bother me too much. It was I certainly. Well, it really was. What yeah. was the? I mean, you mentioned so the Intercept and and some of the other like, let's say left leaning organizations. Uh, let's say a more like. Oh, oh yeah, yeah. First of all, you know me. I mean, I'm I'm kind of center field, right? This yeah, is going to so, piss off you. So I'm so not. let's let's say like a more uh, center left uh, periodical like the New York Times or some of the other um, more mainstream uh, outlets out there. I mean, what 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 did they make of all this? The New York Times was very fair. Yeah. New York Times. Um, I, I, I thought New York Times coverage a of the war there, and the New York Times doesn't pay me. I didn't to say this. Um, <laughs> was, was very good. I mean, really good. Whatever, whatever anyone thinks the New York Times before or after or elsewhere, they've done a tremendous job in in Ukraine. I think in their in their reporting coverage, really good. And the articles written about the Mozart Group by them were were fair. Of course, they didn't. You know, they they couldn't. Go, they didn't go into the whole story. There's much that right, was left right. unsaid. I didn't like the slant of, uh, the, you know, the latest article where it was, you know, there's kind of, uh, it describes, describes me as, I, I forget what it was, um, uh, a solo drift, solo something or other. Drifter? <laughs> Not a drifter, no. Um, uh, whose, whose adult life has been steeped in violence. A hard living, a <laughs> uh, hard living, <laughs> Solo something, right? That sounds it wasn't like, something to put on your resume. Hi, makes, yeah, they're and my you adult like a, life has been steeped in violence. They're making but you I, sound like a badass. <laughs> I'm here to help in your company. 
anyway uh that, no it wasn't that pop and then you know it goes on to making it, it a little bit too much of yeah this is not an environment for you know this is an environment of people who um grizzled veterans struggling with ptsd drinking themselves into oblivion when they're not at the front you know it's a little overdone yeah um because it because a lot of the heavy drinking and and visiting strip bars was done by people who never went near the front you know the rest of it, we, I didn't have time. What, I, what about I, that, well, I think there's a piece in the New Yorker about um, you and uh, what's New York and New York Times. Malcolm, uh, nah. New, Malcolm, uh, what's his face? He's, the, a, he's a little. He's oh, a little there too. Oh, saying, yes. Saying that you guys are mercenaries. Yeah. No, it wasn't New York. It was the Atlantic. It was the Atlantic. Yeah, Graham Wood in the Atlantic. Um, do not, don't fight wars on another country's behalf. The Atlantic, I've written for the Atlantic one article that, but I'm going to keep saying that, right? But the <laughs> point is, quite rightly, they fact checked the shit out of me when I wrote that article. I mean, it, Graham Wood gets a buy because he's obviously, um, no one asked me what I was doing there, but they he's calls me a foreign fighter. I mean, right. he says that. I'm like, how how does and so I wrote to the editor. There's no retraction or anything. Atlantic. You is, and uh, you and uh, Malcolm Nance. Is, well, Malcolm Nance. Is, no. Malcolm Nance didn't have a problem with that because Malcolm Nance it, did join the Legion. He it also to, and, elevated and, 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 his profile. <laughs> well, Ma yeah, I have a problem with it because I didn't join the Legion, right? And I didn't carry a weapon. And I wasn't fighting there. You know, it's just a it's not an emotional thing. It was just an inaccurate description. Mm -hmm. Plus, I have things like you know retirement and all that <laughs> joining a foreign military yeah, so, yeah. I, I mean I, i'm uh I'm, I'm not bashful about the m word but it usually applies to somebody who fights for money that's right yeah right like you're yeah. getting paid by somebody yeah. to go and fight right well he didn't use that term and and it would be absurd to use that term in ukraine because they don't get paid a lot mm -hmm. you know i think in fairness most of the dudes who go there are fighting for a cause of course they are to include malcolm nance um and and i don't you know, we're just in separate categories. That's all. That's he's a foreign fighter, or whatever. He's you know he's serving in in the Legion. He wouldn't have any problem with me describing him that way. I am not. And Graham Wood wrote that article. It's full of inaccuracies. Uh, staff writer for the Atlantic, and he's allowed to get away with it, right? Even after I wrote to the editor, right? It shows that the the Atlantic is not the the um it's not publication that it used to be. I know that sounds old fogey. But I'd be interested to hear well, your. Well, I mean, they should have came to you for comment. If of course, uh, I mean that's the kind of, of course. the the they the close minimum, ranks. the minimum yeah. to do. Yeah, I know. Yeah. And a very basic, very basic. Um, and Graham Wood, to my knowledge, never even came out there. I never saw him. He never interviewed right. me. I never, you know. Right. But he wrote this article. Right. And and it's funny too because you know like you know it, is that it, the it's, one way he describes meeting an American who um, smells of nicotine and B.O. I and I want to add, that was not me. <laughs> <laughs> that was a foreign Because <laughs> I never met him. <laughs> Sorry, go it, ahead. No, it's just, it's one of those things where if no, you... cigarette smoke and B.O. The, the, you know, to, to apply like the mercenary term to you or for people who don't take time to understand what you guys were doing in the Mozart group, like yeah. that you were doing this training, that you were not conducting these operations you know, it's just, it's very minimalist. It's very basic. And and it's very like sort of ideologically driven to not try to understand the different elements that are out there. It's like saying that Doctors Without Borders is a CIA front or it's yeah, like saying, no, I agree with you. You know what I mean? It, yeah. It's like, it's a very, um, a, you, it's a very emotionally unintelligent approach. Yeah. To, oh, they're there. So they must have, Mm -hmm. They must have some reason for being there that has nothing to do with trying to save lives. Right. You've got this dude. Right. They look military. Right. I mean, you, you just read Peter Moss's article. He's like, he's dying to find reasons why we're there. Right. And, you know, now they're planning this in Armenia. And I'm like, everything we... So what he did, as usual, bad journalism, he finds little dregs of truth and he makes shit up that's right. ridiculous. And all he had to do was ask questions of right. people involved. And what he said... Yes, we did send um, a group to Armenia. We cleared it, you know, through U.S. Uh, State Department, and um, we checked in with the DAT 
in Yerevan. And when he came in there, it was all out in the open and it was looking at training programs there. We would never have done that if we hadn't, you know, right. if we didn't get, but he makes this as though we're, we're planning to help them against uh, Azerbaijan as though that's some kind of crime. It's very, but conspiracy. Yeah. It, mm. It's bad. It, it's, it, they read that article just to see what bad journalism is all about. Yeah. And then sadly, if and you that's go the back, Atlantic. we're saying the Atlantic. No, no, it's not the oh, Atlantic. It wasn't now the Atlantic. we're on the oh, Intercept. Uh, oh, sorry. Yeah. The, oh, well, the Intercept. What do we need? What do we need to say <laughs> about the Intercept? I know. Other the than, Intercept. Other that's than the, like that's the, like saying the Bino is not a intellectual. Um, the Bino is uh, it's a, a British um, cartoon. You know, yeah, it's a very very basic comic book that people read if they're semi literate. Like John Walker Lynn wrote for the Intercept. Like, what else do we need to know about the Intercept? He wrote for who? The Intercept. Did he really? Yeah. There's an op-ed he wrote in there, yeah. No kidding. Yeah. About how America committed a bunch of war crimes well, against the Well, you Taliban. know, but actually, I that's that's okay to bring someone to write an op-ed like that. It's not okay when you're the editor of, an, of, a, yeah. uh, of a media organization. And, oh, I suppose it is. But if I suppose it is. You can do whatever the, whatever the hell you want. But if you want to pretend to be a serious journalist, yeah. you don't make shit up yeah. the way that Moss made shit up. Yeah. So... So, what you got to use the the laboratory? Okay, is this where you get your multiple advertisement people will say? Um, and today Jack is wearing his um, FDNY T-shirt. You can also buy one. This is Dress Down Tuesday, right. man. Okay. I uh, watch your mic. Watch your mic. Just on un just unplug it down. You, at the you can unplug there. it down. Yeah, down no, all the way to the box. Where it, no, down there where it attaches. You'll get it. Dave, I was making, I was making cracks at you earlier. Because we share marine DNA when it comes to electronics. Hey, uh, so presumably I leave the mic behind. Just take it with you. Into the restroom? You know? Yeah, but you won't be... Uh, Hot mic'd? Yeah, you, it, while, you're, while you're in there playing yeah. with yourself or whatever you gotta do. Okay, just be very careful with this hand. Just put it in your pocket. Now, if right. you come out of that bathroom wearing a shirt, we're gonna be very disappointed. Okay. Hey everybody! Uh, so we are hey, on. I bet his friends on. Gonna look at your Facebook account. But you and Max. You know. Don't go use the bathroom. Don't take down my lights or my cameras on no, your no, way out there. Him. Yeah. It's, my night vision. It's, it, it's happened before. I'm not gonna do it's it. happened before. It wasn't me. Uh, that's not the restaurant. That's this, right? That that's Dee's home. His little cave. Um, we are at seventy-eight thousand subscribers. Everybody, please help us get to a hundred thousand. We get a really cool right. YouTube plat. Which would, um, you know, it's the whole reason we do this is for YouTube plaques. Um, and uh, please uh, consider supporting the channel. If you guys want access to all these episodes ad-free, there's a link down in the description to our Patreon. Um, so you can sign up there. It's like five bucks a month and you'll get all episodes ad-free. And uh, yeah, and you support the channel. So we really, uh, we really appreciate what you guys do. Uh, I'll take a moment to also plug that this Friday we're going to have Toby Harnden and Justin Sapp here in studio. Right, D, in studio? Yeah. So uh, Justin was one of the, uh, f he w was the first Green Beret in Afghanistan during the invasion with one of the uh, paramilitary teams. And Toby Harnden is a journalist and author. Uh, his book is called... First Casualty? Or? Yes, First Casualty. I uh, wrote, wrote a book all about it. So um, we'll have both of those guys um, in studio at the same time. So really looking forward to that. Of course, I'm subscribing to you guys. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So you plug that in, and the grilling will continue. Um, All right. I'm back in business. <laughs> so I wanted to ask you, you know, since you had uh, quite a bit of experience over there, and I know you're following everything happening quite closely, if we could talk a little bit about, like, where the conflict in Ukraine is today. Yeah, uh, absolutely, yeah. I'm glad you brought that pick, up. Pick, pick up wherever wherever you feel is a natural starting point. Yeah. So, um, so I've written. You're gonna forgive me for plugging this. I'm not really plugging, but I've written um, three articles since the offensive began, and you know I'm I'm not gonna go through all that, but um, plug them. Where, where are they at? They're, they're in my Substack. Okay. So you can, uh, but they're also on LinkedIn. If you go to LinkedIn. Um, follow me on LinkedIn, Twitter. Um, What's your Substack so that people can sign up right now as they're listening? Oh, oh shit! In the description. 
Links in the description, guys. You'll find it there. Yeah, A. Milburn, Substack. Anyway, the, anyway, thank you, though, Dave. Um, so the first article I wrote about, because it, if, if I talk through this, it's, it kind of gives you a sense. Okay. Of, so the first article was centered on Bob Mert. I say, why Bob Mert? Why are we hearing about this place over and over? It was sort of like game? the Aleppo of Ukraine it, it's that a, yeah, it it's dominated a, the media. It's a nondescript, you know, kind of shitty town. And why has it become so important? Um, and, it, and it wasn't just a kind of historical interest. It's because the Russian offensive has already finished. The Russians have shot their bolt for their 2023 offensive. And it was centered on Balmut. Um, Balmut uh, was very important to them because they saw it as a natural stepping stone towards taking all of Donbass. It's really not. You know, tactically, you can bypass Bar Mud. You could find out other ways of doing it, but the Russians got it into their mind. They needed to take Bar Mud. Now, you need to take some places. You needed to take Lissa Chance. You needed to take Seven Nets. You need to, to take Krematorsk. You don't need to take Bar Mud. But they rammed right into it um, 10 months ago. Okay, remember I said it used to be a, a refuge. I'm getting to, to answer your, your, your question. Um, no military value, really, intrinsically, mm -hmm. to either side. Bahmut is in a valley. The, you, for the Ukrainian perspective, they could set up defenses on the western part of Bahmut um, and, and just forget about Bahmut. They could, you know, and from, a, from a military perspective. But the Russians were determined to take that town. And so the Ukrainians, they, they, you know, they, their rationale was, all right, we're in strong positions. This is going to become a Russian killing field, which it did. The Russians call it, predictably, the meat grinder. They've lost, you know, I mean, you, you can, most conservative estimate, the most conservative estimate, which is from UK MOD, is 20,000 dead for Barmut <coughs> alone. I mean, it's just you it's know, astonishing. Yeah. Now, uh, Prigozhin um, says he's lost 20,000 alone in Barmut. So my point is this. It's a killing field. The Ukrainians recognize that. And, and, so they, and then uh, President Zelensky, in his evening far side chats, which, you know, I, I don't speak Ukrainian, but I, I, you know, I'm told are excellent. Um, he started signing off with, and Barmut still holds. Well, now... You know, you've got this Klaus Witzian thing going on of, oh, shit, now it's become a politic it's become politically important. Uh -huh. And the Ukrainian commanders are it started to be in a, in a bit of a bad position because casualties on their side are mounting. Mm -hmm. Now, you will hear various estimates that um, of, of uh, relation of, you know, the ratio of uh, Russian to Ukrainian casualties. What I've tried to do when I look at this, is look at the most conservative estimates. So you, some Ukrainian commanders said they're about 10 to 1. No, they, at, at, at the most favorable that they were to the Ukrainians, they were like 2.8 to 1, which is still significant. Mm -hmm. You know, the Russians were losing. But the problem is the Ukrainians couldn't, can't afford to lose that many people. The Russians arguably can. Mm -hmm. um, so it being an abattoir for the Russians wasn't perhaps good enough reason. So... Zelensky, who, you know, being the leader, he is, I'm not, you know, no one's paid me to support, I, but I, I, I'm in a mar of him. He's shown tremendous courage. He, he said, Bombard will be ours in our hearts when asked about it in Vilnius. Um, you know, and he, he basically said, um, he didn't say it publicly, but he told his guys, look, I don't want, I, I don't want this, I don't want you guys to defend and people died simply because I said it's important to hold right. on to. And to defend what's exactly. essentially a ghost town. Right. Exactly, yeah. yeah. Right. Um, so this was happening around January, um, February. At the same time, a oh, shit, two, an analyst, uh, a Polish and military analyst visited Barmut around that time. And he said that casualties had reached parity. Mm -hmm. And the fighting for bomber, which was added to this thing of, fuck, man, the, we can't hold on to this. Mm -hmm. um, and that place has to be, has to be seen to be believed. You know, it really is. Are, are there any civilians left in Bombay? Oh, yeah. Are there? Oh, yeah. Wow. This, um, estimates vary. We, we were told 2,000 when we were there. Um, they're in shelters. 
they're living, I mean, not shelters, they're living in their basements mm -hmm. without food, without water, freezing conditions. Um, they have to come up to get food. We were delivering food to them. They have to come up to get running water every time they come out on the streets. They're in danger. They're fairly safe in their basements, but what a life. You know, it's, they're safe until a direct hit occurs on their building right. and they're trapped. Right. Um, are they people who just like refuse to leave or are they people who well, literally have, they, they well, feel they have nowhere else to go? Hey, that's second part, okay? So repeatedly the Ukrainian government has ordered an evacuation, but they they haven't been in a position to provide the means to evacuate. How do you do that? You know, mm -hmm. and so it's been volunteer organizations like the Mozart group who were the only, you know, we were the ones evacuating them. So an order doesn't, and, and there was nowhere for them to go. Now, what we were doing was taking people first to Palmerhut, and then when that became too dangerous, we'd take them to Kremitorsk. There was a church group in Kremitorsk who would take care of them um, and, and send them on to places. But the fact is that for internal, internally displaced pers people in Ukraine, that there, there isn't a any safety net to help them. They're dependent on relatives, and how it's not a it's not the government's fault. It's a lack of resources. Right. What can they do? So a lot of, you know, there's so many dynamics. So think about, I mean, Jack, you know this. Think about a, think about a fucking hurricane. Sorry, I didn't mean to drop the F-bomb with Dave. But think about a hurricane here. You know, you always go through this. People go, oh, I'm just going to stick it out. This is where I live. Right, right. And magnify that. Throw in the fact that you've got Russian speakers who are not 100% perhaps trustful that they're going to be taken care of, who think that perhaps they're regarded as outsiders by their own government, their perception, not saying it's true, Max. Um, <laughs> all right. Um, all of these things, and they lived there all their lives. We got right, all kinds. Right, right. And some of them are shell-shocked. I mean, 10 months of just fucking yeah. every day. They're not in their right mind. Uh, it's, it's, you know, I told you it's heartbreaking. It is heartbreaking. Um, all of this. Anyway, sorry. Um, Bomb, you asked me about the offensive. Okay. All right, getting there. So the Russians, it, it's become, as, you, you're, uh, as you're aware, it becomes an internal struggle amongst Putin's deputies. Putin has kind of like, hey, you guys fight it out, all right? Um, so you've got Prigozhin criticizing Shoigu who's the, and um, Gerasimov, right? The... So the, he's criticizing the child, basically, and, and uh, the head of the, the Ministry of Defense that um, saying, hey, these guys not, are not only, they're not only not ta taking Barmut, but they're preventing us from doing it, all right? Offensive kicks off uh, the Russian offensive late January, early February. It's all centered on Barmut. The Ukrainians have already decided to give up the town, ostensibly, but they, when they realize that the Russians are going to expend this attack, they... Um, and they're going to try and encircle it. The Ukrainians seize the high, they hold on to the high ground. The Russians cannot encircle the town, right? So they've, they've ceded the center, but the Russians know they've got to get, there's no point getting the town and then being just, you know, having the Ukrainians in high ground. They cannot encircle it. So, the, uh, so uh, Prigozhin says, you know, it's a last effort. You remember that? He's talking about ammunition, not getting ammunition. Blah, when he blah, started blah. like ranting publicly. Yeah. yeah. These are all the Wagner dead behind me. We've lost one guy for every yard taken, which is a true story. Um, they just try and hammer, continue hammering their way through. Um, interestingly enough, the Ukrainians start to take ground back. As the Russian offensive reaches its culminating point, the Ukrainians take back an estimated 25 square kilometers. Okay, where am I getting those figures from? Um, several sources, but if you look, for instance, Perun on YouTube, who follows all this stuff pretty closely, he gets it from a YouTube, uh, from a Twitter thing called Ground Truth. You're aware of all this. There's a lot of ways to check and double check whether they've taken terrain. This mm -hmm. isn't Andy Moore making up, you know. They've been taking back terrain in Bar Um And, and um, then when, as, as, the, as the offensive starts to ramp up, and then it kind of kicks off, right? But we really, we've gone into a higher intensity shaping phase because something is missing so far. The, the nine brigades that the Ukrainians have trained as their main effort for this offensive have not appeared yet on the battlefield. Mm -hmm. 
right? And why am I saying that? I'm not That's interested. But if you read even from Russian bloggers who are really keen to look out for the breaching equipment that was given them, the Leopard tanks. Um, you know, so the, what we're seeing right now is more like shaping, shaping. operations. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're yeah. still working their way through the, the Russian. And the units too in Barmwood, when you're looking at the Russians saying, hey, we got attacked by the 30, I forget what it was, you know, the two mech battalions there. Those battalions have been fighting in Barmwood for a, a while. So it wasn't fresh offensive troops so yeah what we what we've seen over the last like couple of weeks and what what sticks out in my mind is uh belgorad yeah uh and then on the uh eastern front um it sounds like again i don't follow the conflict as closely as some folks out there do yeah, but yeah. i mean special operation ukrainian special operations guys making some forward progress the last few days and, and some tank offenses like it came out or yeah someone's going to come at me because i said tanks but bradley fighting vehicles being destroyed during the offensive some of that has come out as well. Well, if the Bradleys are being spotted, Bradleys were given to the assault battalions. There um, were so, uh, the, so, this last week somewhere. And, and there was yeah. a, uh, what's it, it's a French vehicle, AMX. I mean, anyway, so you, you get it. There's a lot of these bloggers who are geeks about vehicles mm. who are looking very keenly for this equipment. Mm -hmm. It has not shown up in mass to suggest that the main offensive the main effort, effort is on right. the way. Right. Yeah. right. So I would, I, I'm no expert, but I would suggest that the Ukrainians are still working their way through the Russians' um, main defensive positions. Okay, what are they aiming for? You know, uh, well, of course, they they want to separate east, the Russian forces in the east from the south, the so-called land bridge to the Crimea. What that means to the Ukrainians, if they can break through, all right, to to the Sea of Azov, uh, with a focus either on uh, Mariupol or what's the other place? I'm going to mispronounce it, Melitopol. That is their key, all right, to, to, to bifurcate the forces. To, now. Yeah, that's a, see, yeah. Columbia, but also man. to to, uh, it's to a military bring, term. <laughs> but also because long range. This is all about placement of long range precision fires, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. uh, the Ukrainians don't have attackums. They don't have anything um, that that can range, you know, beyond what we've given them with the MLRS, right? I'm laughing a little bit because the MLRS has been good, but we haven't given them attackums which range out to 300 kilometers. So they have to move their artillery and their rocket, their rocket and cannon artillery up to range of Russian targets in the Crimea. That, if they can achieve that, then that is a significant, it, it's not victory. They still have to unearth uh, the Russians. Um, right, we probably have a few more years. Yeah. But but there's but here's why here's my concern and here's why I'm concerned that it's going to devolve. You know, there's a high risk of this devolving into stalemate, missing piece, man trained. Man trained. Uh, I'm sorry, um, trained and equipped soldiers. Mm -hmm. Russians are desperately short infantry. Infantry. The Russians are out. Okay, a, a, they they yeah, went through convicts. they went yeah. through mobilization in September. It was a draconian effort, mm -hmm. and they raised 300,000 guys, and they did a pretty good job of rushing them into units. Um, and, and, you know, and they, if you look in December, January, they had good units around Barmut. Aside from Wagner Group, they had airborne units that were at first time in the war, 100% TO. Mm -hmm. uh, TO, yeah. Well, they, those have been vastly depleted. So those 300,000 guys, they're gone. They, I mean, they are. They, they've they've merged into combat. Yeah, so even at the most conservative estimates, the Russians are losing 1,000 guys a day, right? Then, you know, you and 1,000 and dead plus, you know. It, it, it's... It, uh, it, it's and they haven't gone to... They haven't made... Putin has not announced the second mobilization, so they cannot get here from there. So my point here is, even if the Ukrainian... Offensive stalls, the Russians don't have enough gas in the tank to launch a counteroffensive. Yeah, that is good news. There's a geometry to it. The, yeah. the downside is the Ukrainians are facing a problem too. Right. Man trained of, of, of getting guys into the line who are uh, an exploitation force. Nine brigades is not enough. What what do you I mean it's not a lot. Of, it is uh, enough. I, I wanted to, you know, query you a little bit about the Belgorod uh offensive that mm. happened and you know the you know, Russian liberation forces that prop popped up kind of out of nowhere and for the first time jutted into Russia proper, yeah. taking some terrain over there. I mean, do, is, do you see that as a feint, as a delaying tactic? What, uh, how do you I, do that? I, I'm not an expert. I have no inside knowledge. He, but his, you know, just from, not, not from me, just like watching YouTube, but sure. from feedback, um, so-called an educated guess, 
those guys are a welcome dis- they, they are welcome helping the ukraine yeah no it, it's not uncoordinated it is certainly coordinated but but the ukrainians are very wary about being too about being aligned too closely with those guys that's right. why they're like <laughs> yeah all kinds of weird shit's happening yeah um and then you get speculation it must be ukrainian special operations forces i doubt it i think that certainly those guys were equipped <laughs> there was some training involved um but you look at that background there's two groups right there's a russian volunteer corps no i'm good thanks um and I forget the name of the other one, but they have one of them has definitely neo-Nazi ties. Yeah, I wasn't gonna say it. Yeah. Yeah. So so the Ukrainians are they realize it's a little bit of a devil's, you know, pack with the devil. They don't want to be too aligned. But at the same time, you know, as Churchill said, by the way, stand by for a historical quote. When um night uh when um oh shit. I forgot the name of the uh what was the name of the operation? Invasion of, of, of Soviet Union. But, uh, Barbarossa. Barbarossa. Thank you, Dean. Off I knew the we had ropes. A, yeah, intellect. Intellect in the audience. Right? When, when, that, was, when that kicked off um, and Churchill was criticized for you know, reaching out to Stalin, he said, uh, if, if Hitler was about to invade hell, I would visit, you know, I would shake hands with the devil. Right. You know? right. So that's probably how the Ukrainians are feeling now. It's yeah. Like, okay, I get it. These guys are not people we want to be aligned with. But when you've got a thousand mile front and you only have 12 brigades to, to play with, any distraction is good. It's, so it's you, an ugly calculus, but if you are going to use people like that, you use them. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> so, and it's quite clever because it is a distraction. If you look at the Russian, uh, I mean, not the Russian front. So if you look at um a map of the uh, you know the, basically the front it's about a thousand kilometers right and it's like a crescent and so you've got all this shit happening right at the north okay you've got um i mean or, or within russia itself those are distractions um you've got the now the ukrainians attacking around barmut like prodding at the at an ulcerous tooth mm-hmm. you know for the mm-hmm. russians it's and that retaking ground and they know how emotional that is for putin to watch if they retake Barmut, as shitty as useless so that town is that's a huge slap in the face it became the a political target basically. yeah they've erased all that and they know that they know it's a distraction but it's not going to be their main effort right you know so solid all two which is in so you think the main effort is driving south i think that i i think the main effort has to we not drive south. It has to reach the Sea of Azov. Mm. Okay. okay, so there's a number of ways to do that. Potentially, you could do that from Barmut. You could go down to Mariupol. I don't think that's what they would want to do unless they suddenly, re- you know, but if there's a gap there, um, I think, you know, I think the, into Zaporizhia province, um, focused on Melitopol, is probably still their main effort. But I could be wrong because that's exactly what the Russians are expecting. My point is, what they're probably doing is they're prodding. There, there may be two or three contingency plans. They're prodding to see where the gaps are, mm-hmm. and that's you know, right. Right, you see where you can affect the breakthrough yeah. and then support that. Yeah, effort. Right. You, you, because you, again, you only have nine brigades, right? You're only going to have one shot. punch. Yeah, yeah. You, you can't you can't have two breakthroughs with yeah. nine brigades. You, you mentioned that like the Ukrainians have the MLRS, but not the uh, uh, attackums, yeah. like the attackums. You know, uh, on the last show we talked about... Which, by the way, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you, Dave. For the, for the guys who are really geeky about weapons, the reason why the United States has such a, such a huge shortfall in artillery tube and rocket artillery is a very interesting story. But we have a huge shortfall. And, and the one thing we could help with is with the attackums. That's a pretty good... Um, we are concerned, I think, that the Ukrainians would use it to attack... Russia, right? That that was actually what I was going to... No pun intended. That was actually what I was going to ask you is that, you know, we talked on the last show about what's going on with Ukraine and Russia, but also the U.S. policies there. And for some people in office, or not in office necessarily, but some policy makers, the Ukraine war, they don't necessarily want it to be over quickly that, that this is a chance for, in their minds, yeah. and, and this, I'm not saying Biden, I'm not saying his administration, I'm just saying people who there are, are yeah, there, there forever. There, there are people who see the war as furthering U.S. interests at little cost 
to the U.S. To the U.S. You know? So is 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 it is right. it possible that one of the reasons because you mentioned like attacking into Russia, but is it one of the like are we giving them more of the defensive and short range stuff so that they're forced to defend? It, it, do you think that that's somewhere uh, on a policy I, level? I don't, Dave. I don't. I don't think we have. I I don't know. Okay. But I don't. I don't think there's a deliberate decision to. Hey, if we do this, I think it's kind of cack handed. Okay. <laughs> I think it's. Hey, we're going to give you this. How, how are you doing? Well, the Russians adapt, and they're like, "Holy shit, the Russians adapted that." Okay, we're going to give you that. Right. Um, yeah. Whereas it, perhaps, you know, those of us who've been in the military yeah. know. Hey man, fucking give them everything they right, need. Right, if like if you're you want, either in or we're it, out. Like if this you want to win it, yeah. like these are well, things you, you give you, them. This isn't a game, right? You, you you give them everything because there's a, a an interesting historical parallel in the in Afghanistan in the 1980s when you know the CIA was famously arming and supplying the Mujahideen. Yeah, yeah. the Muj uh, did a uh, attack. I, I believe it was on an ammo dump in Uzbekistan, then proper Soviet Union, and it became a question. Is the United States now sponsoring attacks yeah. inside Russia? Yeah, uh, you can read about that in Milt Bearden's book, uh, the um, the main enemy. I I think it's a very it's a very interesting. I mean, of course, it's a concern. I would say though, I would say if you look at kind of what's coming out of NATO and um, and and U.S. leadership within NATO and the administration, there is less talk of fear of escalation. Mm. Right, much less, and, yeah. and 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 there's more talk about, hey, let's you know, let's bring this to an end, uh, by by helping you know helping the Ukrainians. We're all in. I I have no criticism. I'm going to sadden you guys. No criticism of of the administration in that sense. I would say the way we did this in the past was not was not really good. We allowed the Russians to adapt. Dave, to your point, the war in Ukraine continuing is bad business for everyone. Mm -hmm. So anyone who, in the U.S. who thinks, hey, this is helping our interests, be honest, it, it, it did. Certainly, it really helped NATO. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it just, it gave NATO, it re -ended. But now we're at a, the point of diminishing returns, the, right? The, the alignment is that our, our interest and what benefits America is a decisive defeat. That's of the right. Russian forces in 100%. Ukraine. Not, not, anything not a 100%. Anything short of that, war. anything yeah. short of that, any ambiguity is bad for the world, is bad for U.S. interests. That I couldn't agree more. And so the question is, is that worth the risk of escalation? I'm not going to answer that. I'm just saying yeah, that um, I am going to answer it. Yeah, no, no. The, the, the fears of escalation seem like they've largely been, I, I would think, uh, sidelined. Yeah. Um, there were, you know, lots of teeth gnashing about that. There always have yeah. been. Um, but we've seen a number of things that were considered red lines. We've seen, you know, uh, the Ukrainians taking back their own territory. That didn't cross so-called yeah. red lines. We've now seen these sort of uh, paramilitary attacks in Belgorod. And then we've seen all these uh, Tanya units deep inside Russia, another video game reference, um, <laughs> drone attacks in, in Moscow, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, blowing up which fuel lines, which, by the way, were all fuel, like fuel pretty, depots, rail well, lines. All done for show, right? When you look at... Um, I mean, you're, 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 what the, I mean, the play, no, not, not show, the, I mean, the, the play, the, but the play is, you know, if the enemy, distraction. if the, in a sense, but if the enemy is fighting a, a war over here, the classic move is to start up a little bushfire war in their rear area. No, I'm agreeing with yeah, you. Yeah. yeah, I'm agreeing with you. They would, they were all, you know, material damage relatively and little. Get the security forces bogged down, chasing yeah. people the, around. Yeah. The, the, all the emotional. Keep the FSB turmoil. busy with that. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, that that stuff happening is is part of it. A very uh, cleverly opaque um, series of announcements, quoting Depeche Mode. You know, um, <laughs> words. On, I I know Dave was a Depeche Mode fan. I but I know, was. Words, I'm, I'm words a Depeche are, Mode fan. Words yeah. words are unnecessary. Something or other. <laughs> I'm like, wow, that's a first in modern warfare, Depeche Mode. Um, and then you you know you've got. You, you've got a series of probing attacks using armor mm -hmm. down in, in Zaporizhia. But mm -hmm. again, yeah. So, so it's going to be weeks before we find out, really, we get a sense of progression mm -hmm. of, of, of what's happening. I think, I think the biggest challenge facing the Ukrainians is that exploitation force mm -hmm. because there's no doubting their aggression. There's no doubting you know, the, it, their courage, but they just, they, they just need... An, they need to a violent penetration, 
they don't giggle at that. And then they need, um, and they need to have that exploitation force to push through in a hurry. And the problem is, how do you how do you posture that? Because as soon as soon as that force appears anywhere in the battlefield, you've got a hundred uh, mill bloggers who are going to point to it. Oh my God, they're coming! They're coming! So this is a problem facing. You know, the, the battlefield is so transparent. Yes, yeah. and that is what they're wrestling with right now. So, and they're doing it very well. They're, they're creating all this weird, you know, smoke not, going on. Not, not to be uh, or, or sound alarmist or anything, but I mean, I wonder if, if from some of the things you've been discussing, is this sort of a make it or break it moment from Ukraine when it comes to what you were talking about as far as sustainability? Uh, I, I, I think it is. So yeah. it's militarily, I, I can't see there. I mean, this is it, right? You know, if it, so, so think about free, think about those three scenarios. Mm -hmm. um, success. All right breakthrough by the way you know let's let's there's really two viable alternatives but let's talk about four all right not to not not to bore you but the first one is just catastrophic success you know they unass the russians totally in Donetsk or you know and 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 seal off crimea breakthrough then the concern perhaps is escalation because <laughs> putin <laughs> Putin, if is it, now he's in a corner, right? He, he's going to fail or he's going to fall, mm -hmm. right. right? Within Russia, uh, because you can hear the voices starting to raise in Russia of what the fuck is going on, yeah. you know? Yeah. Think, um, okay, so that's number one, unlikely. Uh, number two, you know, the objective it, they meet modest objectives, or you know, they don't get all the way to see it resolve, or maybe they do. Uh, but at least they, you know, they made some headway. They've broken through the Russian main defensive positions. Solid. That's where really, that's that's where the the uh, uh, that's going to leave the way really for the U.S. and the U.K. and NATO then to pile in with security assurances, weapons, the F-16s. Exactly. All right. Let's let's continue momentum. The third one is it just peters out. All right. It just totally fucking. Uh, or, or, I mean, it, because there's just no more gas in the tank. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they're taking heavy casualties and they're not defeated, but they just haven't broken through the Russian um, positions. That's my biggest concern. That really is because um, that is a, that's a victory for Putin. Mm -hmm. If mm -hmm. he can hold on to status quo, believe it or not, he will turn that into a victory. Yeah. All right. Uh, the fourth one, which is unlikely to say the least is a russian counteroffensive that actually takes back additional territory they just yeah. they you know they so i would say you know we we were looking at those two things and i can't give you i'm not an expert enough to tell you i think this is all that i can tell you what i'm worried about and i can tell you what they really need for that um to turn some success into victory on the battlefield and a lot of it's going to be political assurances mm -hmm. um yeah. so we'll see you know it's going to see where that where that goes? Do you do you see any kind of? There's a lot of shit. Being, I'm sorry, David. There's a lot, all kinds of dross being talked by military pundits um, about. We're not helping the Ukrainians by overestimating their their capacity here, right? You know, right. and we talk about right. hey, they they will, of course, they'll they'll do this. It's a hard grind, hard fighting. We're sitting here in a nice living room, but dudes are dying in the hundreds, you know, mm -hmm. in, in almost hand-to-hand -hand fighting, even as, as we speak. It, it's, it's like, yeah. It is, is there a, um, it, it, do you, do you see the geography, the possibility of like the geography changing? What do you mean? Like, if we get to the stalemate, mm. um, or, or you know, if things happen, like if if Ukraine cannot push Russia all the way out of, yeah. of all their objectives, yeah. Donbass, Crimea, all this stuff, um, places that, you know, it, do you see a shift in, like, the maps? Is, is there a point where the war is in name only and Peter's out? Oh, you mean like a frozen conflict? Yeah. Yeah, like Donbass. Oh, I, I think that's on. I think that's probably the Ukrainians' biggest fear, that it, this will devolve into stalemate. Uh -huh. um, international pressure for a negotiated settlement will rise. Even the UK and the US will start, you know, leaning towards that way. 
I think in that situation, Dave, to avoid what you're talking about, the US and UK and political, and I, I keep bringing up US and UK, I'm not talking about NATO, because they're the staunchest you know, allies of Ukraine. I think that that's when they start to have to pile in with assurances to make sure it doesn't become a frozen mm. conflict. You know, say, hey guys, this, is, this isn't like done deal. This is a ceasefire. I'm going to take it forward from here. But the Ukrainians, are, they're only going to listen to that, I think, if they've taken extraordinarily heavily losses on the battlefield and, yeah. and they've reached that culminating point. Yeah. Um, it's, that's why this is such a fraught period. You know, I mean, and, and of course, I'm not saying anything that the administration doesn't always already recognize. I'm, I'm just saying that. Um, there's a tremendous amount at stake. Yeah. And anyone who thinks there isn't a tremendous amount of stakes for the United States is is smoking whatever I was accused of smoking <laughs> during the last... On, on, on that note, a, uh, a friend of uh, mine and a friend of the show texted me just now, and, and he uh, wanted me to send his regards and uh, remind you to please not drink so much. <laughs> well, actually, I'm drinking yerba, aren't they, today? <laughs> here, here it is, uh, Thank you. That's always good advice. Yeah, I um, I, I received a lot of kind advice after last time, along with um, to never hang out with Jack and Dave again. I do want to point out though, and I'm not making light of this, guys, but this is our fourth one, right? Yeah. Each of us has had a bad episode when it comes to drinking, except for Dave. That's okay. That narrows it down. I, do you remember we lost Jack one time? We did. Yeah, yeah we he, did. He was supposed to go to the restroom. It was at the old building. Yeah. So in fairness to him, yeah. the restroom was a long way away. Yeah. In it, fairness to him, he's a Green Beret, so... It, it, it know, wasn't that it was far. A struggle. Kind of yeah. a land nap, no go yeah. at that point. There was definitely a moment in that show where I got to a point where I didn't know what I was saying anymore. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I walked him home that That way. was probably the best show. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, it, it's... Anyway, I mean, that, here we are. Like, Th thank you. That's good advice. No, but but mm. but your you know, and that was one of the like somebody said something is like oh I'm like Andy's a good friend of the show like fuck you for like any criticism you have like you you know the first time you were on it was because we had read your book yeah. and had you on about that and then and now and now then, we just love and you. Then and then the second time we had you on the show. You and I, uh, uh, what's the term? Prostication? No, no. Uh, <laughs> Where are we heading on this? Prognostication. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Dave. Uh, we had a prognostication yeah. that Russia would definitely not invade Ukraine. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> And, I'm and more <laughs> embarrassed about that one than the one where I was slurring my words. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's out in the wild. Yeah, it's out on our YouTube. Hey, sometimes we get it wrong first. Uh, but, yeah. but, you know, I, I, I think that most people got it wrong. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I wasn't the only one. In fairness yeah. to us. And 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 I wasn't like, I I wasn't right. I didn't think it they would. It was like would. a week before. I just didn't know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, it was. It was like a week before and then, yeah. yeah, it didn't age well. But, you know, that's what happens when you do this stuff live and, yeah, and yeah. you're honest about stuff it's like nobody gets well, it right 100% of the time I, I love your show and I'm not here paid by you guys although that's a thought right there must be a stage uh, where you fly me in and put me up in a nice hotel yeah. now I'm D don't get me wrong I'm happy to be staying on your sofa tonight it's not that nice. what's that not that nice your sofa anyway at some stage, Stand I know we can up. all upscale. Well, right? if we can get more people to join our Patreon, that'd be great. <laughs> yeah, okay. Yeah. Hey, join our Patreon and house a Marine Colonel for a night. Uh, $5 a month can help house homeless Marine, <laughs> Marine Corps, Colonels. retired Colonels. From Colonels. That's, that's not going to handle the whole population of <laughs> homeless Marine Colonels, Dave, but that's very kind. Man of dubious repute. Jack knows two of them already. <laughs> Do I? Who's the other? Um, Martin. Marty oh, Witterer. Martin. Yeah. I would love to have Martin on the show sometime. He's fun. I Yeah, he, he is. He's, he he's was, a he was old, at, old friend. He was at our Christmas party, and, uh, you know, I'm, I'm talking to him. I'm getting feel. He's, a, he's an old school Marine. Mm. And, uh, you know, just in like a slip in a conversation at one point, I'm like, man, back in your day, like, 
It was just iron sights. You know, all we had was iron sights. That's the only <laughs> oh, thing. Don't get we him started. It was like his yeah. button. The button was like yeah. this big, and I was like, K -k -k. "Don't, don't tell him." <laughs> I knew exactly. What did did he tell you you couldn't handle the truth? Martin, no, Martin, no. Martin, but Martin's Martin, awesome. Yeah, Martin's an old, old friend. I, yeah, he's such an awesome dude. So, <laughs> no, I, yeah. I would, I would love to have him on the show sometime. He's a fun, should, fun guy to talk to. Yeah, reach out to him. He's a great human being. He was, he and Wade. Um, and, and a number of other guys, you know, I don't want to drag their names into this <laughs> forum. Oh, shit. Now I've just mentioned Marty in this forum. That's okay. He's he's a moving target. Um, <laughs> he's, he, you know, he's literally, he, he owns an RV. He can drive around the country. <laughs> the GRU will never find him the places he goes. Um, and, uh, anyway. Yeah, you should bring him on. Where, the, where were we before we got on this? Jack, before we even got down this road... You were edging towards what sounded like a really interesting topic. On occasion, I get there, but yeah. you know, we in these roundabout it, it conversations, just, I, just, I felt it emerging. Where you, you felt like this intelligent thought was finally coming out of me, but it didn't. <laughs> so it didn't quite reach fruition. Oh, no. it didn't quite get there. This is why we're in our fourth episode. Um, yeah. Well, anyway, come back to it. Seriously, so we, we they, something about the uh, oh oh um ah uh, no no it's I know it's gone to me now gone to me but uh, the only other thing that i that i would add and and with good intentions you know so many military pundits they love if anything weird happens they love using the term uw and soft um you know getting back to what's happening within russia now it's ukrainian soft doing this and that i'm sure ukrainian soft is involved in the some training and some i doubt very much it's ukrainian soft dudes in there doing those things online, you know, working side by side for all the dynamics that we talked about. Um, but it doesn't matter. As you pointed out, the Ukrainians are smart enough to realize here's an opportunity. Let's use it. Right. Um, and, and they're doing well. Yeah. I mean, uh, maybe with like long established like sleeper cells, but I imagine it'd be very hard to get anybody in... Uh, I've had arguments with people about this. I'm not going to go there again. Yeah, yeah because yeah. Don't, don't you think we all jet boat teams? It's like, yeah, it's like what we were talking about earlier. They, I, you read so much dross uh, by our, from our own community. Yeah, um, claiming it, it, because we all want to think soft. The hand of soft is behind everything, and it's what you're probably looking at is a group of dudes who are working to make things happen and bring things and and align. Um, what you might call happy circumstances on the battlefield. Oh, I, I could tell you exactly who it is, but I, I'm not going to. <laughs> Come on, Jack, don't tease us like that. Sure. Do we have to subscribe to your, yours no, and no, Sean's no, Substack? Uh, no, I still won't. <laughs> All right. Not on that one. And he stayed in my house. Yeah. Okay, so we, well, where... Um, have we exhausted everything? Well, we got some I, questions. Let me ask some questions real quick. Sure. Um, Andrew Dunbar... Uh, what is Andy's opinion on Malcolm Nance? Uh, Malcolm's, uh, I don't really know him. I'm not, I'm not sidestepping it. I, I just don't really know him well. He's, he, he's uh, every time we, we've, you know, frankly, we asked him to uh, help us with publicity a couple of times because he has a million Twitter followers. Yeah. And I don't know anyone else who's had a mi million Twitter followers. And he very graciously did uh, push out stuff on our behalf. Okay. Um, so you know how it is. You, you, people who, pop up and become um visible visible people that become visible targets to some and i know malcolm is struggling with that as and as are a number of us but I, I i have nothing honestly i have nothing negative to say and he has always been extremely positive yeah yeah i think he had a bit of reputation before ukraine yes um <laughs> yeah I, I mean i i'm not i can only I think I'm, you know, I can only comment on my own yeah. experiences and, and with him. What, yeah. Not as right. so, so not Malcolm Nance, and, and I don't want to like relate this to him because there was there was an individual I, I I don't recall his name now who was huge on Twitter. Vasquez. Yes. Yeah, I don't I don't know him at all. And and so, you know, what what happened with that? Did he did it turn out because he was posting stuff about. He he was fighting he, at the front. He was posting about fighting at the front, and then it came out that basically he wasn't really? at the front at all. Yeah. And people were sending him a lot of money. Jesus. Wow. A lot of money. I, you see, why wasn't that shit coming to us? 
Yeah. I don't, I don't. See, I've got no comments on that. I will say this, though. If you look at his videos that he was posting, none of them were, like, of combat or of no. something. He would, he was, like, shoot plates. And or then or they'd that, be at his foot. They'd be at his foot. And it's like, I'm not posting because of OPSEC. Oh, right. But yeah, we're yeah, at the yeah. front. Yeah. Yeah. Because um, no, no one, no one that kills with them. Yeah. Much. Or he would, or he would yeah. take, like, videos with, like, I, I, with Ukrainian soldiers, like, showing, like, food that he had brought in. Sure. But there's no telling, yeah, you know, where, yeah, so. Yeah, I, I mean, I, you know, this, I mean, as we talked about it, sadly, these these circumstances, war zones bring in dross from all over. And yeah. I'm, I'm not calling him dross, I'm just saying bring in, bring in people who, yeah, whose intentions are not always pure, let me put it that way. Yeah. Um, thank you for the very generous uh, donation, uh, Kayla or Kala Davis, uh, nothing but respect for what you guys do. Thank you. Uh, Andrew, thank you. Can uh, Milburn share his thoughts on uh, Prigozhin, uh latest drama in the Russian power structure? Oh, interesting topic. Yeah. I, I'm, really, I'm really beginning to wonder what is in it for Prigozhin by doing all this. You know, I got, I got it. I understood earlier. I understood earlier as it was... You know, the Russian military was clearly having problems. So Prigozhin being able to come in saying the Wagner Group, we're here. But the Wagner Group has reached its culminating point yeah. now. So him continuously banging the drum and, you know, and being very vocal um, obviously means he knows he's not going to be put in check by Putin. Right. And obviously means he's hitched his wagon to Putin. But, but he's, he's saying the kind of things that get you liquidated. Over yes. There. Yeah. <laughs> But it's a, it's it's just supremely at this point. Earlier, it was risk and reward. I understood what the reward was, and the risk seemed minimal. Now it seems like extremely high risk. But he's got nothing that he can back it up with because the Wagner Group has, you know, I mean, unless he brings in more dudes, or unless he's now as you know just blaming his failures on, on, um, on, uh, on the Russian military. Does he craziness he, though? Does, have you have you seen the video about in a, uh, of Wagner of a um, Russian colonel clearly being beaten? No, by Wagner oh, group dudes I, and, and and confessing to uh, targeting Wagner. He's he's being interrogated oh, by Wagner shit. and he's like doing a, a he's being taken prisoner by Wagner, Russian army colonel. I'm not making this shit up. You can look it up. So the internecine fighting i mean it's become fighting right it's, you know it's 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 extraordinary i don't know but it only it only uh can be good for the ukrainians that's right. what i can say so i welcome it <laughs> but at some point you know i and and everyone's wondering why you know putin seems almost disinterested in the right. war you know so on the day that the ukrainian offensive kicks off he has two appointments that day none of neither of which involve any discussion of the war and it's as though now his subordinates are just talking shit to one another. Their soldiers are battling it out in an uncoordinated fashion. Yeah. You know, all of this suggests, I don't know. I'm Breakdown. Not a, yeah, I mean, you've got guys who are far more uh, well-versed in, in criminology than me, but it does suggest kind of a, a breakdown, doesn't it? Um, and Andy, thank you, for, or Andrew Dunbar, thank you very much for the generous donation. How about answering a full-on stupid question in a serious manner? Javelin missile system plus horse cavalry troop equals viable recce element. You can now clone a horse for $85,000. I think the remount is cheaper than in the past. <laughs> what? I'm going to let Jack, that's Jack's actual field of expertise. He, Genetics you know, and javelin missiles? Yeah, he's written an article that's coming out <laughs> on his sub stack. It's a pay, pay only. Uh, with the javelins, I mean, I have to suspect they've pretty much blown their load with the jabs I at this guess. point. Yeah. yeah. Um, but, but it's not a ja it's not. Well, let me point it this way. We it, Phase one, right, was very much a javelin wall. Right. Phase two was not. It, the right. ranges were right, such. Right. But now they're getting back to close fighting, but not as a, necessarily as an anti-tank weapon, but bunker buster. You know, the Javelin is, an, I mean, it's an expensive bunker buster, but it's an extraordinarily effective one if you're going the offense. 
Uh, I haven't heard reports right, of the Ukrainians right, right. using them. Um, they probably don't have enough, but yes, that would be. I, uh, I wrote an article for uh, ConnectingVets.com about the kind of like the history of the Javelin and its introduction into Ukraine prior yeah. to the recent outbreak of fighting. Um, you can find it on there if you're interested. It's like yeah. a deep dive on Javelins in Ukraine. I can't remember the exact title. Where is it? On ConnectingVets.com. You have a you you have a, a very impressive resume of. I don't know if it's impressive. I, but I, think, you know, I, find I it stay impressive. I, I stay I, busy. I'll say I that. I follow much. in your wake, picking up scraps. <laughs> but yes, I will certainly read that with great intent. And I just uh, fact checked that. Seventy thousand dollars a missile. And and you javelin. can clone a horse for eighty five thousand dollars. I don't know. That's why the you would... that's the cost of a javelin missile, I believe, around seventy eighty thousand dollars. Yeah, but the and, missile, the clue is like one hundred and twenty or one hundred and thirty or something. That's like that. a lot of money, man. Yeah. Uh, I got my ass chewed in um, Iraq once for, in, never mind, but in Fallujah, yeah, we used a, a javelin, I mean, because they're great I mean, against the defensive positions, we used the javelin <laughs> rather than sending guys into a building and I yeah. remember being well, explained, that... having my battalion, commander of the battalion I was attached to explain exactly how much seventy thousand dollars worth was, which was more. Use it in the direct fire mode and blast it right into a bunker? No, it was into a building, yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Well, I mean, that sort of... It's actually a minaret of a mosque. But before everyone jumps on to <laughs> criticize me for war crimes, the, the Mouge were, of course, defending. Yeah. I, I, was, I eat that one out slowly. Yeah. I was trying to decide how About much the no to strike tell you. list? It was... <laughs> yeah. But no, that became a, a very popular strategy once they no, realized... No, Bax Blumenthal, it was not a war crime. <laughs> yes. It was we were taking. Yes. Yes. Um... <laughs> Yeah, I just want to rag on Max Blumenthal a little bit more, uh, you know. I don't think we need to. I have a couple questions from uh, Isaac. On yeah. Patreon? Yeah. You want to read them? Yeah, let's, yeah, let's answer the questions from... Uh... Yeah, the team house is always kind of like riding that edge of like, are we going to end up in like some... Uh... With our shirts off? Well, there's that, yeah. Um, but also, are we going to end up in like uh, on a, in like a hit piece in some newspaper or something? We're, like we're trying hard. I, I welcome it. Uh, I guarantee we'll end up in the intercept. Hopefully, we can get up. <laughs> yeah, but you know what? That any article that comes out in that rag is probably not doing us justice. I think we need to shoot for. A, um, I thought I thought the reference from the New York Times was awesome. That we encourage people to come into our living room setting and drink hard liquor yeah. with the hosts. Which yeah. isn't... Pretty, that's accurate. Yeah, it's not, no, it's yeah. not fact, inaccurate. We have fact-checked that as true. Yes. I mean, if you read that in New York Times, would you believe it? Yes. Accurate. Yeah. Wasn't, that, wasn't, that, wasn't that what we used to be told? Uh, the New York Times test, right? Um, Lieutenant, if what you just did appeared on the cover of the New York Times, would you be happy? <laughs> <laughs> well, I've had to answer... <laughs> I had no choice, and <laughs> so I must be. <laughs> but yes, I mean, I think that would be fair. Sorry, next What's question. the next question? Isaac's question is, will you go back to Ukraine or maybe even Taiwan down the road? <laughs> no, no. The Beethoven group is coming, man. <laughs> I'm pushing for it. No, that's not in my, that's not in my, not in my plan. So you're saying there's yeah. a chance. Like it's on the drawing board, <laughs> the Beethoven group. Right now it's in Taipei. just, yeah, right now it's not, yeah. Taiwan is not on my uh, my list. No, no, the uh, serious answer. Uh, I have no plans to do either of those things. Um, you know, I've got a, a family to take care of and a life to continue. So your M word days are over, is what you're saying? Yeah, yeah, definitely. It may not seem like much of a life to you guys, but it's mine. It's what I have. Yeah. Well, I mean, look, you could always sit back and edit people's videos and write hit pieces <laughs> okay. for a living. Apparently, I'm enjoying apparently writing. for a communist, it's a good living. It's quite I, lucrative. I mean, uh, you're a communist. But enough about you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I love writing, as you know. Yeah. It's therapeutic for me. I told you, too, I've, I've, got, I've got back into skydiving, which I love. Well, I hate. Yeah. I'm shit scared every time, but I, I love it. It's, it's you know... So I'm enjoying life again. Yeah, that's awesome. In a oh, very uh, personal level, I love love spending time with my family, my kids. That's great. The dog Richie we rescued from Ukraine, and and uh, he alone is keeping my hands full. 
Yeah. A little bastard. I mean, he's so destructive. Who can blame him? You know, right. I mean, Russians destroyed his home. Right. He's going to destroy every other fucking home he lives in. Right. Every game. <laughs> right. <laughs> it's like humans. You guys can't give me shit for chewing up your sofa. What? What? Uh, what is obviously? Obviously, people in Ukraine support Ukraine's war effort because they don't want their country invaded. But we also like we saw that video of like a bunch of kids out at a club party, and like that got a lot of flack. But it's also like. People are gonna. People still have to live their life. Like yeah. they're not gonna take in aus- yeah. austerity yeah. measures. Yeah. you know, I, in their own. I, I was town. in. I was in the. Uh, I was in Damascus in the middle of the civil war at one point, mm. and I, was, I actually happened to be there on Halloween. And it's very odd because it's an American holiday or Dutch holiday that came to America. But anyway, in central Damascus, there were kids out on Halloween <laughs> dressed up like vampires yeah. and stuff like that. Yeah, German holiday, wasn't it? Walpurga, was it? Walpurga snack. Me, you're, you're, I didn't know. You're, you have a anyway, higher, higher, but uh, that's very. But I mean, life goes on. Life for goes on. Their kids. That's the point. Yeah, yeah. I, in any, that's one thing that always, regardless of war zone, it isn't just Ukraine. And yes, I find it jarring. Six hours from Donbass, I'm in Kiev, and Kiev is like any Western city, right? Right. right. And yet Donbass is like the mo- is is Passchendaele. It's Verdun. You know, it, it, the contrast was jarring. Stalingrad, but. Yeah. Ukrainians have explained to me they want it that way. Even soldiers have said, I said, you know, do you get, do you feel pissed off? You want to go home to somewhere. When when you come back and there's all these dudes, you know, with man buns, nothing wrong with a man bun. If you might, you know, but there's no reason for one, right? Right. I mean, it's a luxury. There's There's no reason reason, for a man bun. Um, You know, but Ukrainians value that because Mm. they don't want to see a blacked out city. Right. You know, um, right. And and you think about it, the, the, that pattern probably is being unchanged throughout time. You read about First World War, um, you know, I mean, the, the villages or towns behind the front line um, were were scenes of, of great, not celebration, but kind of a, a well, yes, you know, it, it almost desperate. Uh, right, right. Sense of embracing life, right? Right. Um, I wouldn't say it's desperate, but it's certainly life goes on there. Uh, very much so. You'd be surprised now, if you went to Kiev now. I think most people would be very surprised. It, it, it's interesting that that was like try that, that people attempted to try that try to put that out as a negative thing. A negative thing, like yeah. a PR like. People people are under pressure, under stress. Like no shit, they want to go out and think of, of something something else other yeah, than war. right. Yeah, uh, of course, it's not surprising. Yeah, I mean, it's I I I've you know in the end I I, I find it quite I find it inspiring. You yeah, know, I, I remember um, you know when the first cruise when the first uh, back in October when the first missiles. Started uh, and and drones started coming in, and everyone was down in the in the metro, and you could see kids there doing school in the metro, and I found that depressing. Right, I'm like, shit, the city's come to a halt. Right, you know, and then gradually people started to realize, yeah, it's risky, but it's a calculate. It's not that you know, it's a calculated risk. Right, you know, your chance, blah blah. Life goes on, so I'm I'm happy with that. Hey, you know, before the next question, something just occurred to me when we're talking about democracies. Even in the midst, in the, even in the crucible of war, tolerating dissent. So when the when the British started bombing German cities, okay, it was after, you know, the Germans supposedly bombed London first time through a navigational error, right? <laughs> and the British turned around and bombed Berlin, and then it, you know it was on. Um, but uh, there was a, I forget his name, doesn't matter, MP in Parliament, a First World War veteran, who would every would just rail away at the government about bombing German cities saying we're no better than them blah 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 and that was to- that was tolerated no one called him a traitor right you know right um but it was uh and and if you listen if if you look at because i'm a first world war geek if if you look at um there's a fascinating exchange between churchill and this guy and it's no rancor in churchill's yes yes that is one of my fears that we will be as bad as our enemies you know instead of telling shut the fuck up you're a coward right or you're a you know you you're a traitor it, he listened to them they tolerated them and that was so much more powerful than trying to say no you know don't stick up for our enemies right, right. crushing them right that to me was an example not because i'm half british of how a democracy 
goes to war. Right. You there know. was this um, a, a World War II veteran. He's a, a Brit who was uh, taken as a POW, and I'm sorry, I can't remember his name off the top of my head. But he's a POW, and he was in Dresden during the bombing. Oh man! And the account, it's like slaughterhouse five. The account, Co- the accounts, Co- you know, yeah. The, the stories yeah. he he would tell for the rest of his life are just the most horrific thing you can possibly imagine. And um, I believe he turned into, if not a communist, like a pretty hardcore socialist yeah. after the war. Turned into a, a pacifist. Yeah. And and just because he's so, I think he was so horrified by what he saw. Yeah, you know? and credit to the Germans because they had uh, a number of uh, Allied prisoners in Dresden at the time. Vonnegut, I wanted because Slaughterhouse Five. I don't know if you read that that book. L- Kurt Vonnegut. Years and years and years. Yeah. Ago, yeah. So Kurt Vonnegut, the book is about a U.S. POW in Dresden. I mean, that's part of the book. I, I believe it was Dresden that bombed, um, and. Uh, uh, and I believe it was uh, Vonnegut was a, I can't remember if he was a POW. Anyway, it doesn't matter. But it was based on you know a lot of it was obviously a, a, a great book. Uh, but that but it was about the same thing you're talking about, Jack. The the the, the okay. feeling of empathy or the feeling a closer now to your enemy In a to sense, your enemy yeah, than yeah. to you know the people who who did the bombing. Yeah, mm. I mean, is that in part? Is there any amount of Stockholm Center to that, or is it just that, like, I think that... I don't think in that guy's case it was Stockholm Syndrome, it's, per se. It, it, it's, I, it, I, he, wasn't, he wasn't a Nazi or anything. Right, 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 right. But, but he, like, uh, like, I remember one of the stories he tells was that the fire was burning so intensely he saw civilians, like, pulled into the fire by, like, the yeah. suction. Yeah. They are actually, like, pulled into the flames. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so I, I think that was, you know, kind of where he was coming from. The, the, um, I know this is off topic, but much is made of, um, Hiroshima and Nagasaki and obviously, you know, the nuclear, the, the, those are horrific, but the far bombings, um, Tokyo, yeah, yeah. you know, that took place in, in, uh, Japan, uh, Dresden, Cologne in Germany, um, by all accounts, Almost as, if not equally horrific, yeah. You know, um, as a atomic, yeah, bomb, yeah. You know, and, and and for for numbers themselves, obviously, you know, long term nuclear it doesn't matter, but the the experience itself, the um, thousands and thousands of that, tens of thousands of, of civilians, you know, casualties. All all this happened in in the name of Western democracies, and I'm not criticizing, and I'm just pointing out what a complex thing right. war becomes, and, right? And those who want to see it in black and white. Are, are sadly mistaken. And those who think that hatred is helpful in war hey, just don't read history. You know, right. That's why you have to tamp down on that hatred right. constantly. Right. Yeah, there's there's that mm. difference between like fighting because you hate the enemy and difference right. between fighting for freedom. Yeah. Right. I mean, they're separate but related things at times. Yeah. And and sadly, you know, I mean, in, in Ukraine, it's become a, a real hatred. Understandable. Um, and, yeah. and it's understandable. Uh, Again, like, yeah. like anybody who... who I feel like anybody who, who says that, who observe, who sees war as this, just this thing, whether as this thing that, well, of course you don't have to teach people not to commit war crimes. That's just dumb. Like you're admitting that that these people are horrible people. It's like, yeah, your neighborhood has never been. We we all, everyone in this room, all of us can commit a war crime. It, it, We're all capable. It, it, uh, and, and anybody anger, fear I, I've seen it you've seen it I, I mean the, the frontal lobe shuts down it, uh, and, and you are not Jack Murphy you're not Dave Park you're not D you, you become it's, it's something it's situation dependent right? yeah. you, could, you could take that person so of course there's some psychopaths out there that, or that are maybe right. exceptions but right. the average person you know you could pluck them out of that environment even a guy who's like a, who's an ISIS guy 16 year old ISIS fighter if he wasn't there and he was in a peaceful environment he wouldn't be doing that crazy that's shit that's 100% the platoon um, Cali's platoon did very well during pre-deployment training they had a higher le- they had more high school graduates than was the norm in the United States Army um, no disciplinary problems, fewer disciplinary problems than, uh, than, than other platoons in that battalion. This was all, again, this is a great article that came out a few years ago in New York Times, a great, uh, you know, historically. The difference was Cali. I mean, that's an, that, that is what turned that platoon from a group of Americans 
American, you know, guys who are high school kids who wrote home to their grandmothers into a group of rapists and murderers. It was Cali. Uh -huh. it, it was he, anyone who reads the story of, of, of that platoon, Charlie Company, whatever it was, Americal Division, can never say, can never toy around with allowing your men or people, you know, under you to, to, to talk in terms about the enemy that become really, you know, defamatory. I right. mean, I, it's a, it's a thin line. So it started in Cali's case. Yeah. It started with him slapping farmers around in front of the soldiers. Um, a girl gets raped. He doesn't investigate it. Right. And now the messages, it, the implicit messages are, wow, this is okay. And, and it, you, then Cali starts drawing a correlation. You know what? Every time we lose a guy, we're going to pay these fuckers back. Right. An 18 year old brain. Okay. That makes sense. Well, That's I mean, why. honestly, even a 40 year old brain, like the, the thing is, is that look at the Stanford prison experiment. Like, yeah. Yeah, like, yeah. like civility is, it, it, it's, there's a thin line and you have to be very, sure. very clear in what you will and what you won't do and why you will and you won't do it. And what always amazes me, I think, are like if you're a journalist and you're covering war crimes and you're covering those things, by all means, like it, it's an it's an infestation and it needs to be rooted out of the military. And and it's not it's not going to get rooted out one time, right? It's something that needs to be addressed over and over and over again. And that's the U.S. military, Ukrainian, Russian, Japanese, Chinese. You know, it doesn't matter. It's across the board because it's human nature. Um, but the thing is, is it, it's one thing to expose it, right? And then it's another thing to sit on a moral platform where you've never been, you've never had to make a decision or you've never been in that situation. It is very easy to, um, uh, to obviously there's a moral judgment and, and that's okay. Like war crimes... Are bad okay um but there's also the idea that you would be immune to that influence and that 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 that's not you know that anybody oh you mean going into it right you think that, yeah 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 but then, how, how do you represent that as a journalist though do you say like like have a caveat at the end of the article like if i was there i would have fucking executed the civilians but, too no 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 how, how no, do you, no, how do you but, represent but, that no but i th i think uh, that there's a difference between uh, reporting on it uh, uh, factually you, you know, i think i'm I, th I think that's great so i think where you're heading is it's very easy by by just simply painting these guys as evil men yes you you're avoiding the most important issue which is no anyone can do this so there's a book, um, I forget what it's called. It's called Very, no, I, I remember what it's called. I forget who wrote it. It's called Very Ordinary Men. And it was about um, the German, uh, you know, the battalions that followed the frontline troops in, in Barbarossa, just, you know, executing yeah. partisans, yeah. And, mm -hmm. uh, Jews and anyone. Um, and that was their sole job. Yeah. Um, I forget, extermination squads or whatever. And anyway, it's about those guys who... You know, wrote, called their you know wrote home to their wives and mm -hmm. their kids, and it, it's it's too easy and to to just it, it's a very it's a very facile. I think what he's saying is it's facile. It's not it's not really doing um, an adequate job as in journalist simply to report a massacre and and just paint them as bad guys. It, like, well, or or they are bad guys if they do the massacre. Yeah. But <laughs> but a, but but, but, but the country itself or there's the, an institutional the, problem. The, 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 that it's yeah. it's like all Americans yeah. or all Ukrainians or all Russians or all Germans or all Japanese or all Chinese well, or whatever. I, I, that, I think sorry, I, I mean No, the, the great example of, of what you're saying, the squad in Haditha. All right. Um third battalion First Marines. Didn't matter. I mean, that squad could be any Marine squad. Right. You know, and, and in, in the General Mattis, uh, who was then uh, who was then First Marine Division commander, he'd stop it. He, um, he fired the battalion commander even before the investigation had finished, and he was criticized for doing that. But enough had emerged about the battalion commander's inaction to satisfy him. And when he and I was I was at the time at school, not school. I was going for a course for 
four battalion commanders who've been selected about to take battalions. And I remember Mattis came to talk to us after firing this guy and he was like, you know, and, and the, I knew the guy, he's a good guy, but Mattis, I think was 100% right. And Mattis said, hey guys, here's what happened. You know, you had a battalion that had been through Fallujah. They were like gung ho. They, mm -hmm. they were used to door kicking, you get a new group of guys in. All they're hearing is stories about Fallujah. Man, you should have been here. Wow, it's and now they start taking casualties, but it's not quite the same, but they think they can react right, in that in the kind same of way. way. And there's no one to step in and tell them no. Right. I, you know, I'll, speaking from like some of my, not direct experience, my like things I've investigated journalistically on, on the United States military, Part of the story is right. That's the it's the individuals who commit war crimes. Mm. There is another part of the piece that's not so often reported, which is, I think, especially in the war on terror, uh, about commanders who, I mean, they, not that they made the decision to deploy over and over again, but they came to this conclusion that if their soldiers showed up at work in the morning, they were good to go. Yeah, and they deployed these guys, and these officers deployed these guys over and over and over again, when a lot of them were not good to go. Um, that they had lost teammates, they were abusing fentanyl. Mm. Uh, there was, you know, all the other sort of precursors that emerged: the substance abuse, the families dissolving, all these sorts of things. But they kept deploying these guys, and in some cases, after incidents came to light, they just left them out there. Yeah, they just left them out there in mm -hmm. the hinterlands of Afghanistan, and that's a part of the story. And I and I think that part is not so often reported. Mm -hmm. I, I don't think that I think the 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 gunshot is the the sort of kinetic event that crystallizes the war crime stories. It's but the background. There, there is it's what leads to it. There is another yeah. aspect of it mm -hmm. that um that certainly, that's certainly in the in the about. certainly in the soft community. Yeah, very true. And in fairness, though, and you know this is true, um, the real impetus for redeploying was the guys themselves. You know, so a lot of times people have to be saved from themselves. Yeah, right. And right. and you know, I th I thought about this a lot um, because I had to be saved from myself, but. I really did. I mean, that's what you know, I'm not bringing it back to me, but it, it makes me think now back um, and, and understand so much more, understand so much more that we should have said, no, I don't care mm. what the fuck you say you want to do. You're done training. All right. You know, and you need to sit this one time out. for a JROTC well, yeah. deployment, man, yeah. <laughs> a little bit of time out, you know, yeah. like, I, I mean, I don't mean to keep bringing this back to, Max Blumenthal's treatment of you, but 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 I have a, to, it's a war crime. But 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 I, but I have to in this instance. He asked it, right me and left me in a ditch. It, yeah, but I have to in this instance in this thing in, in you know you said it was a very facile uh, you know like argument. It's either it's the way he. Oh, it was it was, it was just shoddy journalism. So too. so I mean, the, so the thing is is he was either intellectually dishonest or he's just stupid. To say to say that when you say oh. we are trying to keep these people from doing the things, it's, he goes. No, no, no. It, this it, this shows Ukraine is a shit he, country. It's the, he, it's the first one. He, yeah. he he doesn't give a shit about yeah. what was said. Right, he cares about the two million views. Right, that his now most of those are within Russia, but that doesn't care that because his wife's Russian, she's probably impressed by that. Right, you know Max gets laid. Um, he's a big hero. Um, yeah. All is good, man. And, um, but, you know, again, that's why I don't think we should pay too much attention to, to him. We, we needed to clear that up and yeah. talk about it. Yeah. Um, but he's just, he's not important. He's a proxy of the, of the Russians. He thinks, uh, he thinks he has agency. He doesn't have agency. Right, right. They've got him by the boss. Right. He know? couldn't write an honest piece about Russia. No. Right. No. Right. He's got too much invested in it. Right. That. Yeah. Right. Uh, do we have any other questions? Uh, or is that. Local, we got one more donation from General Discharge, who's got a pretty big uh, YouTube channel, does some cool stuff. Okay. So, well, thank, thank you, man. General. Appreciate uh, thank that. Thank you. Uh, thanks, General Discharge. Was that General really... Discharge yeah. under other honorable conditions? <laughs> General Discharge could have a number of meanings. Yeah. Yes. That's true. That is very true, but let's <laughs> go right, right now. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I mean, it, it's it's very interesting. Uh, you know, war is horrible, but war is also, uh, 
I mean, it's where warriors want to go. You know, it's it's. And I I think all of this is like a very like healthy conversation to have. You know, particularly in wartime, right? And I, I mean, I don't say that um, to like from the cheap sheets, uh, the cheap seats. Uh, you know, sitting sitting back and, yeah. and, and lobbing, yeah, yeah. lobbing spitballs at mm. guys, as you point out, are, you know, dying in hand-to-hand -hand combat. But America is involved in the conflict as well in our own way. And, you know, we should have these types of conversations. I want to talk about, you know, I, and I want to answer all the, all the questions. I just very quickly want to talk about something you touched on, mental health. Sure, you know, yeah. I'm about it, what you said. Yeah. Um, you know, on the, uh, a, my own... You know, my own, um, I don't want to say struggles, but, uh, you know, just very quickly, those of your listeners know, or, or audience, I mean, I, I've been, aside from, uh, as many of us with the backgrounds and combat places we've been and the bad experiences, um, I've had personal trauma, I lost my sister and my daughter, um, same time, you know, going through a divorce, a lot of, a lot of bad things happening. Frankly, I, I was in a very bad place. I, I was saved, I think, by luck. Um, I think if I didn't have the coping mechanisms, if I was more junior, if I come out of the military more junior in rank, if I didn't have the education that I'd been given or the background or just the wasta of being able to go to the VA and say I'm not happy with this or that, I would have been lost. And I don't know what had happened. I wouldn't, I'm not saying, you know, and, and that disturbs me. It's, um, I'm good. I, I'm, I feel whole, but I think about how, you know, I'll just use an example when I was on this show and, and we talked about mental health and I said, look, I've tried, um, you know, I, I've come off, uh, I've got to be careful about this because, you, you know, like a lot of us, I was diagnosed with, uh, you know, combat stress, being, you know, whatever, and, and prescribed uh, Zoloft in all good intentions um, but I didn't like, it didn't feel like it was helping me and I didn't like the thought of putting those. So I, so I talked to you guys about, Hey, I tried cannabis in a state where it was legal. Um, and then I get a call when the show is aired about my security clearance, um, and a very kind of threatening email yep. and a series of interviews that were not pleasant. And I think I'm talking about solutions here, right? I'm saying I needed help what I was getting wasn't helping. That's not necessarily my fault. I found something that did help and no harm to someone else. And it was legal. And yet I'm facing loss of security clearance. Right. That's everyone's biggest nightmare. That's right. why guys don't come right. forward. Right. right. And it's just happened to me. So anyone who says and they tell you it, it doesn't, doesn't happen. happen right. It, that's it what they say. Fucking happens. Right. Okay. That's, yeah. that's the, sober. that's the yeah. line. That's the no, line. That, that doesn't happen that's anymore. Yeah. Okay. So I'll be okay. Yeah. Right. If I uh, hopefully I don't lose my security clearance. Yeah. But the fact that's even a discussion. Yeah. I didn't beat my wife. Yeah. I didn't. You know. That that's what you call a witch hunt. Exactly. Right? Yeah. That the U.S. government's combing. That's through what podcasts. they come. But, that's what they got out <laughs> yeah. of this. But right. And, and, right. But and that's the thing is that, you know, a lot of veterans go. I don't want to go to the VA. I don't want to get treated for post traumatic stress. Because of red you flag get a laws, stigma. you get a you get absolutely because there is a stigma. because of red flag laws, yeah. because of this, because of that, and then as soon as and then, if but you, the thing is, it's real. Yeah, and but if you're looking for right, because I, you know, <clears throat> I don't know. Everyone's got everyone's got a point at which they cannot sustain any more grief to, to right. behave like you're, I came you're, to that a, point. you're a SATA threat because you tried marijuana to treat some of the issues. Right, because I'm, I'm 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 struggling right. with grief from loss of my right. daughter, sister. Look, if you so, would have come yeah, on right. and you said, well, "I'm pounding a fifth of Jack a night," nobody would have said shit to you. Probably, you right. know what I mean? Like it, it's, yeah, it, it's one well, of those. No, no, in fairness, that would have been. That would have, that would have been a problem too. Yeah, no, you know, I, I, uh, no, I but, get but it. The, but the, but my point is, the impetus wasn't Andy. Right, you're having problems. How can we help? Right, it was. Let me go after you. Right, for your security clearance. Right, because you just fucking and drag you into problems. a room and interrogate. Right, you and I said it. something. I didn't say it to. I'm, you know, I'd rather keep that secret. But my point is, we're talking about stuff that other people are probably dealing with right now. Yeah. Right. Yeah, we, we know they us, are. We all of us have had multiple friends who've taken their lives. Yeah, and we can't. Yeah, we can say, hey, that we can try and rationalize it, but we all of it. It isn't a fucking coincidence. Yeah, that, that is happening. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, 
And and so did they come after you for talk about the post traumatic stress? Did they talk to you? Did they come after you for the cannabis? It's they... just all about it was all. There's nothing about how I am. Can I? There's nothing about hey, are you are you thinking about suicide? Which I'm not. It was all the cannabis. I, I wish I, you know, I can, I'm not going to show you the emails, but maybe this is speculation, uh, Andy, but did, did you feel that it was really about the cannabis or it was about the things we were doing in Ukraine and the Mozart group and that this was a, a sort of retaliation? Could be. Yeah. Good point. And, and the other thing is, is yeah, because it would be absurd. If it, it was is is somebody in OPM watching every fucking episode of ours to see if somebody had missed maybe. Doing something? <laughs> maybe at this point. <laughs> no, this was a few months after it came out. But someone had gone trolling, <laughs> looking. It's almost as though someone had come looking for shit on me, mm. which is you can find plenty of shit on me on the internet. You know, I mean, I was a essentially a public figure. Yeah, uh, is I'm that not, how that shit works? Like some fucking you know poor guy who was a lance corporal in the Marine Corps does a podcast and he admits that he used cannabis to deal with PTSD, and they're gonna shake him down over. That's what I wonder. Like, is that's that what is I, that how except it works? He probably wouldn't have a security clearance. You know, I, right. I don't know. Well, I, he, he might yeah. depend on what his job was. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah. Meanwhile, on Discord... <laughs> <laughs> Got some slides to share with you. Look at this, boys. <laughs> no, that dude is clean, though, when they gave him a piss test. <laughs> Good to go. He was good for work, man. Yeah, the All right, government's what other got, questions to me? No, the government's got to really, like, you know, going back to Bill Clinton, you know, who who puffed but didn't inhale or whatever. But, but like, the government's got a really weird stance on this stuff that... It, it's, like, rooted in some sort of, like, 1950s moralism. Yeah, um, I, and the I, VA I, won't I, accept it. Well, like, I, I think, you know, I mean, it's very interesting... I, again, you find me saying that a lot because I find all this interesting. But yeah. If you look back, history of you know the counterculture drugs, it's because um, s drugs became too closely became not too closely entwined with counterculture. Yeah. Timothy Leary was a professor at Harvard. Yeah. And had actually done serious research before he said tune in, drop out, and Nixon called him America's uh, public enemy number one. Yeah. And you know, so there was there was some science behind psychedelics. Um, psychedelic treatment of trauma there was a ton back then. Uh, so there's a great series on netflix called how to change your mind yeah uh, I've, I've watched that it's great and yeah, it talks about that. it talks about mushrooms it talks about uh lsd it talks about um uh mdma and the research that was going on in like the 50s and everything until it escaped the lab like it was it was like all like and very effective and then it yeah. escapes the lab becomes part of the counterculture like you say and then government's like oh we can't have that and so research gets shut down completely it, yeah. we uh we interviewed on this show my friend uh jim morris a vietnam veteran and he talked all about how he came back from the war and he used lsd really yeah yeah as a, to, and and then he probably didn't know about you know they talk about set and setting you know in other yeah. words it, a very deliberate approach to using psychedelics to treat trauma he probably didn't know about that I, I don't think he uh, no i don't i don't think he i wonder if he even really recognized that he was using it to treat P ptsd yeah. initially yeah. well we talked to mike who spent like a oh, winter yeah. like yeah. a winter like after vietnam he was uh vietnamese uh, he, he was on a vietnam he's marine corps um uh cap yeah yeah and like Heck, yeah. and went to cap, went to yeah, yeah. yeah went to india and like wintered with a swami in a cave like smoking opium and what yeah uh, oh after yeah after <laughs> after um and uh san juan uh sam yeah you know yeah. who mm -hmm. did the uh she the, went uh, well, well opiates did. opiates a little different those are bad news you know i mean obvious reasons no i do i think it's important well, to i don't keep, know if it was opium I, or hashish. I, I, I don't remember I, what it was i think it's so when we talk about things yeah. that do um, yeah so i think you know opiates and cocaine bad addictive yeah. toxic yeah, yeah. Um, psychedelics, non-toxic marijuana, yeah. non. Anyway, I'm not. I'm I, not here defending drugs. I and I say no to I, drugs. I could be wrong with the opium too. I don't remember what it was he said. Actually, it was a long yeah. time ago. But we talked with uh, Sam Juan, who mm -hmm. you know Use did for her post-traumatic stress. Like did a um, like Ibogaine. a sponsored program. It was it was actually it wasn't oh, Ibogaine. It was, it was mushrooms. She said they did a hero dose mm. of mushrooms with with a counselor. Yeah, and it helped a lot. Like. And for the, it, I know a lot of dudes I, again, it, it, again, it goes back to what you said is that 
a lot of veterans will not come forward about their post-traumatic stress. You know, like in the 70s, it was all the made-for-TV sh- series about a guy becoming, you know, <laughs> thinking Charlie's in the wire and shooting up That's his right. office space, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, and now it's, you know... Now Charlie's in the wire and you light up a joint and yeah. you lose your security clearance. Yeah, yeah. It's just, it's absolutely ridiculous. There's one more question. Yeah. Yeah. We should Norm yeah. Anderson, please ask Andy what he knows about Fallujah, April 12, 2004. It was the worst friendly fire incident in Marine history, and it was covered up. Was it covered up because Duncan Hunter was involved or because Duncan Hunter Sr. was the chairman of the House Armed Services Committee? I read Tempest, and it was excellent. Yeah. Um, who, who was that? D? Norm. Norm? Yeah, Norm, I, I, I'm not, I wasn't in Fallujah in April. I was there in the second battle in November not not familiar with what happened i i haven't heard about that incident um if you yeah i would love to i mean i'd love to get a link or something to to read about it but i'm sadly i don't i don't have any comments because i i don't i i hadn't heard about that man so this has been a wide-ranging conversation it's been really good good i I, I can't i can't wait to see what's edited out to uh (laughs) To us for for character assassination, pro- pro- probably nothing because you know they got what they wanted out of it, and yeah. they don't want to hear the 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 actual story no. and the background yeah. and all. The and I'm no longer a, uh, I'm no longer a, a threat or a you know yeah whatever, right. I'm just Joe Blow sitting until in the Beethoven unnamed, group spins until up. You stop it. Sitting in unnamed town in the United States that in a house when it's not being sullied by Jack. <laughs> 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 yeah. Well, Andy, we love having you on. Um, you know, people, many, many people have reached out to us and asked you to be like our third host. You um, should. And I'm, I would love to. I'm all for that. Are we Would you let me do that? Yeah. I'd like to take a few more vacations, so I would love to do that. Come on you in. You are welcome anytime. Holy crap. Yeah. Do I get paid? Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll maybe discuss. You're on probation. Ding. You're on probation. Jeez. For like, okay. <laughs> right. that, uh, okay. We'll, we'll bring J- that that, we'll, that J. Jonah we'll, Jameson meme. I, we'll, you want to be paid? <laughs> we'll bring you on as you an intern. You mean there's a chance? <laughs> we'll bring you on as an intern. Yeah. I don't um, trust you two, but D, I'll listen to D you. D stand up. All right. Yeah, cool. D, D is All right. a stand up. So we've name. kept your subscribers. Hopefully we've answered their questions. I think so. The one about Duncan Hunter and Fluger on April 12th. I'm going to look that one up. You'll get yeah. to the bottom of that. Yeah. 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 Anyway, I, I want to say thank you very much, um, and I, I want to say thank you to all of your uh, all of your audience subscribers. I'm not just saying this, no, but uh, you can clearly say from most of the comments, except the ones that are very adverse about me, that, they are, <laughs> that you've you've got a surprisingly high intellect, average intellect among your audience. We do. Uh, well, the, yeah. the the folks that are like asking questions are like very engaged and very yeah. interested. You know, they're there they're there because they're interested. So yeah. Well, I want to say thank you to, uh, you know, to, to uh, all of them um, and to you guys. It's been, uh, it's been great, man. Thank you for it's coming in and doing Andy. this, man. Yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll do it. Well, you know, we're going to change some shit when I'm here as co-host. Move things around a little bit, Dean. That's okay. okay. Big changes coming. Yeah. So, Big changes. Yeah. So, we can talk about it. Yeah. <laughs> so Andy didn't drink at all during this episode nor before the episode, so there can't be any slurring of him. Next time you come in, though, we're getting Where's hammered. Where's my book? It might be on the other bookshelf you over there. You fucking people. Yeah, I, I have a copy to it. Can my you house. believe that? It's here. <laughs> it's here. It's we have two other bookshelves over there, filled with books. Yeah, I'm just so hurt. Um, but buy his book when the tempest gathers. Yes, link please. is in the description for the Amazon link and the Substack. Link okay, is cool. In the yeah. Don't wait on the paperback. The hardback. Just go is, get it now. Yeah, just get it. It's better. Yeah, I'll sign it. It's hard. If you bring it to if you bring it to the studio, I will sign it. I promise you. All right. Final final thoughts, anybody? Thank Alibis. you, everybody. All out. Yeah. Thank you, guys. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. Uh, make sure you tune in on Friday. We'll be here with uh, Toby and Justin. Look forward to seeing all of you then. And uh, until then, we'll see you on Friday. Good night.